Hi, I'm Laura. Hi, I'm Deanne. And I'm Philippe. And welcome to our Lyman Book Club. We are reading The Game of Kings by Dorothy Dunnett. We're on part four, chapter three, which is my all-time favorite chapter of anything I've ever read in my entire life. <laughs> it is I, the penultimate chapter. I can't wait to talk about it with you guys. And there's a lot to discuss. It's a good chapter. Um, so let's start with your reactions. Who wants to go first? It was such a good chapter. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I love this chapter so much. It was the culmination of lots of things and I felt like like vindication of lots of things and we found out a bunch of stuff and well, I don't think we necessarily found out a bunch of stuff actually. I feel like we just kind of got confirmed in a bunch of stuff, including Philippe's theory, which we will get to later. <laughs> Not complete confirmation, but I'm a lot sure more sure of it now. Right. <laughs> a lot more sure of it now. I'm so sure you're right. I'm going to be super surprised if you're <laughs> not right. <laughs> like, um, and yeah, but it was just so satisfying. So many things were satisfying. So. Why was it satisfying? Well, I think we can talk about it as we get to all the various things, but I just feel like things that I wanted confirmed were confirmed character interactions that I wanted to have happen, happened. Um, yeah, so I, as a reader, I felt really satisfied. I felt like things that were being teased and led up to and like anticipation, like she'd been building, a lot of the tension that she'd been building was released in this chapter in ways that I really liked. Yeah, although not all the tension's gone, but. <laughs> It's good. Cool. Philippe, what did you think? Oh, well, I think Dee summed it up pretty succinctly. Um, I mean, a lot of things that we've been hoping uh, at the end of each video, when you sort of ask us what we want to happen next, a lot of the things that we've been saying happened in this chapter. We get that second confrontation between Lyman and his brother, Richard, and it happens in a completely different way than I expected it. We sort of get finally a Richard who's throwing his sort of vengeance driven mind to the wind and thinking with reason and logic and realizing that he's been wrong and like completely changes his mind, which is a moment that I really want to spend some time on when we get to that. Um, we see Richard reunite with Marietta. We see that Sibylla actually does know a lot more than she's let on and that she probably knows almost entirely what's been happening this whole time. And there's proof that she has been in contact with Lyman this whole time in this chapter. Um, just a lot of it. We get the end of the storyline with Johnny Bullo and the Philosopher's Stone, which I had no idea where that was leading to. And now we have it. Um, we yeah, get that scene happened in the middle and I'm like, why are we spending so much time on this? Like, back to the I was kind of like, that's the main idea. And then I was like, it was oh, important. Okay. It was important in the very next second. Yeah. Um, and then like, we also get Lyman's confession of like, yeah, of course I attacked the castle and this is why, which is great that he's like actually spending the time telling people what he was doing instead of just sort of, you know, pushing it off to someone else. So I really I like that. how he was like offended that it, they thought he was so incompetent at burning down the castle. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's like, like, no, I purposely didn't try to burn down the castle, but I had to make it look a little convincing. Yeah, and th there's also a moment there, we'll talk more later, but like he, he didn't know for sure that Sibylla wasn't going to tell Richard that he had returned the silver. Um, so it, it, you see everything suddenly in a new light. Like he didn't know for a while that Richard didn't know that he wasn't so bad. So like everything, he, Every like after you read this chapter, if you go back and read the rest of the read the book again, like every scene has different meanings and you see different things all of a sudden, knowing what was going on. Um, Which I may do before. Let me read this again before we do the second one. I don't know. Maybe. I think it would only take me like a day or two to read it again because it's so. It would I was gonna say, how fast can you read? <laughs> so, especially if I know what's going on, I could read it. Pretty no, I did that right after I read it the first time. I just like immediately read it again. And then I immediately went and got the next one. But yeah, I had to just like, be like I was just like, holy crap, I have to go 
like everything that I thought suddenly is like mixed up, mixed up and different. Um, so this is my favorite chapter for a few reasons. Um, I made some high level notes that we'll dive into because I also made a lot of detailed notes. Um, but I think the number one thing that I love in this chapter is the first section, which is called Strange Refuge. And it's the way that this story is told on the level of kind of the subconscious emotions and the most kind of elemental human emotions and this deeply personal elemental connection of, of brothers. Everything is told through their sort of childhood brotherly love for each other. That's what saves the day. Um, and the, that, that moment you're referring to where Richard subconscious breaks through and he realizes I have to go save my little brother just makes me cry. It's so beautiful. <laughs> I love it so much. Um, and then also, I think the way we get Lyman revealed in this chapter after he's been so opaque and such a mystery, I was not expecting this complete breakdown and this attempted suicide. Yeah, it was um, this is what fanfic does. This is not normally what you get in like the published fiction. This is like what fan writers do to fill in the gaps that you don't normally get. Um, and I feel like she had led up to all this stuff in the subtext that he was, you know, maybe he was taking these like martyr-like actions because he was suicidal and he would be, obviously you'd assume he'd be really traumatized after the experience of being sold into galley slavery, but to actually have it all come out in the open so explicitly, like I did not expect that at all. And I was so, I was just like, this is what I want out of this story. This makes me so satisfied. Um, yeah. And I love the way that she also kind of, this is like, this is like the hurt comfort trope in fan fiction, but the physical hurt here is just a pathway into the psychological and she uses these situations to like really push the characters to their limit and kind of strip away their defenses and, and put their life, one character's life in another character's hands and, and like force them to sort of have the most intense conversations and ex like relationships and experiences with each other that they can possibly have and like that's why that trope is so popular and she uses it so well to get the heart of the characters and also that's why it's so satisfying. Um, so let's dive in to this chapter. Um, all right. So first off, um, oh, I thought we should read the, um, the quote at the beginning because it's so apropos also to what happens which is if you read it translated in the uh, ultimate guide, it's, and also it behooves them to first have cure of themselves and ought to purge from the self all abscesses and all vices and that they should hold themselves pure and ready for to help others. Um, how do you guys think that relates to this chapter? Well, it's interesting. Itself, it's all abscesses and vices. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, it kind of relates to me that Lyman is sort of letting the, the fallacy of Lyman drop. And he's really sort of reaching out to Richard and telling him the truth about things that happened. And I mean, there's a lot of this chapter where Lyman isn't ready to accept help from Richard. He doesn't trust him. He doesn't believe that Richard is actually out to like, to any good. But like, I think he has to put that past himself in order to realize he's going to die if it wasn't for Richard in this chapter. That's part of it. Yeah, and if you think about like the abscesses and vices, and I'm always a little suspicious with texts that are super vintage because you never know if the word, has the meaning of the word changed over time. But when I think about an abscess, it's like a wound that needs to be lanced before it can heal. So. <laughs> the idea that, which is almost like you wound a wound again, <laughs> before like for the wound to heal, you have to wound it again. And so I feel like that's super, like that metaphor of hurt being something that ultimately heals this relationship in this chapter makes a lot of sense on both a physical and emotional level. And then that idea of sort of juxtaposing vice and help like you have to get rid of how to say purge yourself purging which is another sort of healing phrase by the way you purge things um 
but to purge yourself of vices so that you can help another. And I just think about both Richard and, or both Lyman and Richard, but particularly Richard. Like, how is he purging? Lyman's so hurt physically, but Richard is doing a lot of purging in this <laughs> chapter. <laughs> so. Yeah, it really yeah. speaks to both brothers. Exactly, I agree. I, it, you know, Lyman actually throughout the first part of the chapter is trying to help Richard. He's trying to stay alive so he can reconcile things with Richard and get Richard back to sanity. Um, but he's got his own issues that are stopping him from being able to fully help Richard. And then of course Richard doesn't, ends up helping Lyman, but he has to go through a lot of purging of his vices to get there. Um, okay, so then we open with the bell of Hexham Abbey opening its lips to the pagan moon um, and sending its voice across the river. And this is in Latin, but it's, um, its translation is, with my living voice, I drive away all hurtful things which is a medieval inscription found on bells in the west of England. Um, you mentioned irony earlier. Um, the bell is driving away hurtful things and we're about to get to the most hurtful chapters of the book. Um, so we're back in the dove pit. Um, why does she choose the dove pit for this scene? Burned out, abandoned dove pit. I mean, there's... I, doves represent peace and like it's just ironic to begin with that there's this dove coat that or however you say it that's you know used to have all this life and now it's this burned out shell and that's sort of where Richard first begins to try and nurse Lyman back to life so there's like a slow building peace that's growing between them and this house that represents peace could also be like the piece is burned out of it because it's damaged and this is like their their relationship as brothers should be a peace and, and refuge a place of peace and refuge but it's not because of the damage that's been done to it it's also very like a skeletal and eerie like a tomb which is very apropos since Lyman thinks it's going to be his tomb yeah I was gonna say like a dove coat at least the way this one is described is super elaborate. I mean, it's, it's a complex structure that's got a lot of pieces to it. And it's got a lot of like, hidey holes and places for the, the devs to live. And, and uh, it's, I mean, the description was just, it was kind of beautiful. But yeah, it's this husk of this incredibly complex burned out mess of a structure that probably is not that stable. You know, so you get that idea that this is, this is not a refuge, it's going to fall down pretty soon. <laughs> and hmm, yeah. just like. I also want to point out how incredibly inept the English are, that they're hiding out in this dove coat that's literally like a block or two away from the Hexham Abbey. And they know that Lyman's body has disappeared. So like, instead of searching the immediate area, Richard and Lyman are in this burned out shell for literal days. And nobody finds them. Like, come right. on, Let's try a little harder. But it's realistic too, because you can just imagine that they're all back in that room squabbling with each other instead of making a plan. But for four or five days, which I think is about how long they're in there. Well, it is on the other side of the river, isn't it? It's not exactly right next to it, right? Isn't the dev code on the other side of the river from the Abbey? Like, I mean, it's sort of. Like it's still close enough that it could have been easily searched, so. Yeah. I mean, I guess they would assume that if Lyman was gone, that he'd left Hexham altogether, so. But no, because he's been shot. I, I don't know. Yeah, he's been shot. They thought he was dead. Like, they didn't even go check on the body immediately, because they thought he was dead. Like, five minutes later, they waited. I was like, well, We're getting ahead of ourselves, because yeah, we still have the Richard in the dev coat. Like, <laughs> there's, this one, there's these lines about Stokes that I love, about how, like, Richard is still lost in this complete, passionate, it's almost like he's, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's like he's, he's uh, he has no sense of what's happening. Like he's so out of it because he's so laser focused on revenge and can't see anything. And then we've got Stokes luckily was gifted with patience. <laughs> and it's just this like, um, 
this guy who's just holding him back and and uh, it's it's i love the way that that it just throws in these like luckily this guy yep. you can see why he's tom's uh best man his favorite of his men the yeah. reliable one um so speaking of tom richard's here pacing stokes is watching him and rolling his eyes um and then uh, richard shows up um which is also just every line in this is beautiful. Like she found her, she found her voice in this book. This is her first novel, which blows my mind. Um, but yeah, the hoofbeats, like harried spirits follow the tolling of the bell. Um, and Richard comes back, um, or sorry, Erskine comes back. Um, and I like, I like the characterization of, of him, Erskine's own gaze, newly fierce, newly level, beat down Richard's to the floor before he answered curtly. So Erskine has changed to having just lost Christian, having witnessed this scene and actually having led, you know, this whole like race to rescue the queen basically, um, despite the incredible loss that he's just been through. Um, and so of course all Richard cares about is Lyman more so than did you save our country. Um, and so then um, they've unloaded the blankets from Erskine's horse and Erskine pulls the pulls it aside and reveals Lyman, um, devoid of mischief or anger, silent, defenseless. Richard's brother lay at his feet. Erskine knelt by the plastic body, clothed and clotted with blood, and touched Lyman's hand. Um, and we get, we get throughout these references to them as brothers. Um, so that in this case, she's saying Richard's brother, like this is, he's gone from being the master or Lyman or whatever to being Richard's brother. Um, oh, go ahead. And and I, I I also like that Erskine just flat out told Richard like you're wrong. I mean he he didn't even he didn't equivocate at all. He just said if you believed he was England's secret insurrectionist, you're wrong. He killed Atchison himself. Atkinson Atchison 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 um, himself, and then there was no real change in the fanatical gray eyes. So Richard is just beyond any, like Jenna is so clear that Richard is, he's so lost in this fanatical desire for revenge and obsession that he can't, even when someone's just like, dude, you're wrong. Yep. He can't. Um, and so he's, He's looking at his brother lying defenseless and near death and debating whether or not to kill him then and there. Um, and he just barely stops himself and decides not to. Um, and not because it's his brother and he loves him, but because he wants him killed publicly and lawfully and painfully and fully conscious. Um, and then Erskine and the men leave. They leave Richard behind with Lyman. Um, and we end this little segment with Richard had stooped over his brother and with excited face was scanning the engrossing tally of his wounds. Did Richard's reaction to seeing his brother near death surprise you? So I was reminded, there's a line where Tom says, come with us, Richard, let him alone. You can't seal him alive in the larder like a bloody wasp with a fly. And just that image of he's saying like Richard you can't eat him is is the metaphor there and it as soon as I read that line I was reminded of um Beatrice's line from Much Ado About Nothing where she says she's so upset about the um betrayal of Hero that she says she wants to eat their heart and eat his heart in the marketplace and just that that is she's so angry and that Richard is has is lost in that same way. Like he wants to devour him. I mean, metaphorically, but. And Tom's just like, you can't do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, did it surprise you, Philippe? No, I'm, I wasn't really surprised that he's keeping him alive, especially given his reasoning that he sort of wants to make him suffer in a different way. Um, it's like, this is too easy. Yeah. In Richard's mind. This right. is, this he, is not he has to suffer. I would have been surprised if he out loud said, well, I can't kill him now. Like he doesn't tell 
fur skin or anything. I'm not going to kill him, but you know, if if they had left him there in the dove coat and left, he uh, absolutely likely would have died. So, the fact that Richard stayed behind is a little surprising, but not how he reacted when uh, Lyman first showed up there. Yeah, I mean, it's too. He wants Lyman publicly humiliated before he dies. That's the that's the key thing. I don't think it's necessarily the death or not death. It's the public part of it. And yeah. So um, we kind of cut away to a little bit later. Um, we have Lyman in the cold sleep close to death um, and Richard having kind of initially dressed his wounds um, and Lyman is lying there, the artless sleeping face of his childhood. Um, and as you, as you read this chapter, you keep seeing these references, um, not only to them as brothers, but to their childhood. Um, and ultimately what this builds up to is this chapter giving us that childhood connection that redeems their relationship and also giving us a lot of backstory about what their childhood was like and how it led them to turn out the way that they are. I think there's a little bit of foreshadowing where, um, Right at the top of 437, where he, the, they're ta he's ta the Dennis talking about Richard is experienced with this kind of first aid, basically, he's, he's done this before. And it says, um, he's helping, he's telling he'll line that says, missing nothing. The scarred hands, the old whippings, the last degradation of the brand. And there's a point later in the chapter where it talks about there's things happening in the back of his brain that he's not, <clears throat> that aren't happening in the conscious part of his brain, but that he, he's mulling over something and it's not coming forward. And I think that little bit there is kind of the beginning of some of the, or the beginning of putting it together, even though he's not aware of it, he's, he's not missing anything. And all of this information about Lyman's physical state is becoming part of that back of his mind, figuring stuff out. And what do those things tell you? What is R Richard figuring out? The, well, the what Lyman suffered. Like he's seen all this evidence of his past suffering written on his body. Um. There's a little section in here that kind of explains that this is, again, the ultimate guide to Dorothy Dunn is seeing things. Um, so in France, a galley slave who was con a convicted criminal um, was uh, branded with TF for like forced labor in French, and a slave or a prisoner of war was branded with GAL. Um, so that's hard. Um, wow. And Sorry, lightning in the background. Oh, no worries. Um, and the, um, this, this it's also has a- clear at my place. That's so weird. Oh, I see the storm, it's coming. Just to go with I'll leave to everybody for my quick startled face there, so. <laughs> um, so this also has a, such a horrific description of the life of a galley slave that I don't even want to read it, but the, High level is it almost inevitably entailed a death long before the sentence was completed. It meant in the majority of instances that the victim was gradually whipped to death. So Lyman is indeed incredibly traumatized um, and scarred and his brother knows about it. And for now, his brother is still behaving like a sadist. Unsympathetic. Uh So um, Lyman wakes up. Um, this is such a gorgeous description of the location, the, the pale dawnlit arches of the lantern and the wintry skeleton of the potents and the dark enclosing walls with their hundred upon hundred of empty sockets, black and salaciously flickering with the dying glimmer of the fire and the wide fathomless eyes of his brother resting on him. So it's like they're almost in this like, interim state between life and death, you know, it's almost like the Grim Reaper is, is waiting there. Like it's just such a beautiful, eerie location. Um, the first thing Lyman says to him is, you still snore like a frog. Um, which again, going back to their childhood and their common brotherhood is, 
Like that's how Lyman is trying to connect with Richard. Um, Richard then, um, he, he kind of hasn't like properly cleaned up Lyman's wounds yet. So he decides to do it now. Um, and it, 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 she's really vague about it, but you can basically extrapolate from this. It's the stop, the top of 439. He's dressing Lyman's wounds. It says the bowls of water became scarlet, blah, blah, blah. And you get Richard's thoughts. What explained the killing of one's son, the seduction of one's wife? And these were the hands that Marietta knew better than he did. This the mouth, this the marked body. And then it says Lyman took too long to recover after the dressing was done which tells us that Richard, you know, touching Lyman's body is hurting him because he's thinking these terrible thoughts. So he's basically torturing his injured brother as he's like addressing his wounds. Um, I wrote on my note card, holy shit, Richard, exclamation point, exclamation point. Like, which one of these guys is the villain again, supposedly? And I mean, Lyman's response where he just says, all right, I love sadism too, but try that too often, Master Haleabas cat, and you won't have a mouse left to play with your move. And I, I mean, he was just like, you're gonna kill me if you keep doing this, and ouch. Did this surprise you that Richard went this far? Not entirely. He's shown himself to be sort of the man that would do this in earlier chapters as well. Yeah, what surprised me much. most is how quickly he sort of comes around, but we'll get to that in a bit, so. I don't think Lyman thought that was quick. No. Yeah, yeah he, I was not surprised. I think, I think that he is not viewing Lyman as human at this point. Like he's not viewing his brother as a person, just in, adversary that needs to be conquered. Um, so Lyman then, uh, well, sorry, Richard comes back is a little later and he says he's found a new spot for them to move to. Um, and Lyman does not want to. Um, and he says um, he needs to talk to Richard about Marietta. Um, and Richard doesn't want to, um, and Lyman kind of starts, you know, forcing it and lecturing Richard about, you know, what happened um, and, and explaining, like, you know, you screwed up your relationship, but not because of me. Um, what's Lyman's goal at this point? I think he wants to make a confession before he dies. I think he wants to say, oh, I didn't have anything to do with any of this, so listen to me. Like, I want you to, I'm gonna die soon, so this is the last time I have to set things right, and I want you and Marietta to be together. I want you to find uh, a good reunion. I also think he genuinely cares what Richard thinks about him, and he doesn't want his brother to think that he cheated with his wife with it like he doesn't want Richard to think that he betrayed him that way and I think it's important to Lyman that Richard doesn't think that and it also shows that even on his deathbed he's willing to try and protect someone else because he's also trying to protect Marietta's good name and her reputation mm -hmm. I think his primary goal is so yeah, like you guys were saying, to get Richard and Marietta back together, basically, to save his brother's relationship. I don't know how much he cares what Richard thinks of him. I think he's trying to save Richard's soul, but I do agree that deep down, like, I think his conscious motivation is to save Richard, but I think his unconscious motivation probably is what you're saying about he doesn't want his brother to hate him. Yeah, I think he cares what his brother thinks. I think he cares more that his brother is safe, both metaphysically and physically, but I think he does care. Well, and it, it becomes apparent later when he talks about, you know, how basically he talks about how hurt he is that Richard can't recognize their kinship and that he's not, you know, the devil. Um, but I think it's also super apparent in the subtext that, like, right, not even subtext, in the text, Lyman really loves Richard. <laughs> he really loves his brother. Yeah. yeah. Um, so at this point, you know, 
Lyman is giving Richard this uh, well-meaning lecture about how to be a better husband. Um, and Richard gets so angry that he actually has to storm out and kind of like take a breath outside and take off his sword to stop himself from physically killing his brother then and there. Um, and I love that she says, with the last rags of self-possession, he throws himself, like he drove himself out the door. And it's just like the threads that he's hanging on to, to not kill his brother. <laughs> he's really around the bend. Um, so then Richard comes back and listens and Lyman tells him that he was gallant at mid culture um, through being <coughs> most damnably drunk, but never again. So he flirted with her the one time, that was it. Um, and uh, he did not lure her away. Um, he actually saved her. Um, and also he did not send the jewels. Philippe, do you want to comment on that? <laughs> Well, I think I already knew that, so that's not a surprise. Um, I actually want to go back a little bit, and uh, when Richard storms outside, he, he goes through this litany of wrongs that Lyman has committed against him. Uh, a shouting, uh, sorry, an arrow tearing ignominiously into one shoulder before a shouting crowd, a drunken glover in a frozen ride, prison at Dumbarton, and so on and so forth. And if my theory is correct, I would say 90% of these things weren't things that Lyman actually did to him anyway. Yeah. I think Lyman did leave him on the wild goose chase with the glove, but everything else I've already pretty much figured out is Dandy Hunter or, and you know, also, when he got thrown to jail, that wasn't Lyman's fault at all. That was Richard just being bullheaded and stubborn. Even the glove thing is in large part Richard's fault. Well, like, yeah. yes, Lyman, led him on the wild goose chase, but Richard did not have to go tearing off at Christmas, you know, <laughs> like most of the negative parts of that were Richard's fault, not Lyman's fault. So. I also really enjoy when he does say, no, I didn't send the jewels and Richard, oh, you haven't any idea who did, I suppose. I don't see why I should spoil another man's fun. Although he must have been damned annoyed to find me getting the credit for it all. If you're curious, you could try asking mother, which shows me two things. Number one, Sibylla knows what's going on as well. And two, Lyman and Sibylla have totally been in contact, maybe not face to face, but through means throughout this whole book. Yeah. So, and there's other things that Lyman says later that shows me that he and Sibylla have been chatting behind the scene, so. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Um, it is now totally storming at my place. Like, that was yeah. fast. <laughs> I love that we've gotten a storm for this uh, stormy chapter. <laughs> if you hear lightning, it's sorry. <laughs> uh, so then Richard, of course, does not believe him. We're at the top of 442. Uh, and Lyman says, no, I suppose not. I could enact you Phoenicia-like tragedies and you'd believe them. But the truth, as I once said to someone, and then he seems to stop, Richard says, what? And Lyman says, is a queer thing to meddle with, said Lyman rapidly. Do you guys remember what what that line about truth is referring to and why Lyman kind of cuts himself off and doesn't finish? I recognize the line, but I couldn't remember who he'd said it to. I think it's about um, Eloise. I don't know why, but there's a moment later where they're talking again that he really doesn't want to get into talking about Eloise and he tries to push it off. But I think he's like, oh, well, there's truth to what really happened, but I'm not ready to talk to you about it yet, so. So I think you're right that this concept about the truth um, is part of why he doesn't, or part of why he's afraid to talk about what happened with Eloise. Um, but this is also a specific reference to the conversation in the tent with Christian where they talked about truth and how it's like, once it comes out, you can't take it back and it's hurtful. Um, I imagine he cuts himself off because Christian's death is so raw, it just happened. Um, and bringing it up with Richard isn't gonna help their relationship either. Um, but it is interesting because if, if he really is innocent, why is the truth such a scary thing? Such a dangerous thing. So I get the feeling 
and maybe I'm maybe I'm off on this, but I get the feeling that Lyman doesn't actually know the truth about what happened with his sister. That that he's afraid to find out something, and that that he thinks he knows what happened, or he thinks that he didn't cause it, or that he wasn't the main cause, or something like that. But that there's potential that he might have done something, or that, and and so I feel like there's this desperation to clear his name, but there's also, and then there's a desire to find out the truth, hence the tracking of the three men. But I feel like there's also some hesitation on his part, and that he's scared to actually know what happened. That would totally work with the guilt he feels towards it, because mm -hmm. he does feel guilty in some sense, and that would, if he doesn't know exactly what happened or how it happened, that would scan. Yeah. Believe if you're typing, one of you's typing. No, no I don't know what. It's on my air conditioner. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's, I'm, yeah, I'm it's not, the ring. Not touching the keys, so. Yeah. Okay. Nobody's yeah. typing. It's the ring on the air conditioner. <laughs> I was wondering. Sorry. <laughs> you're gonna hear like this tap, 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 tap. <laughs> No, I think you guys are right. Um, I think that there's like, cause we don't, still don't know what happened with Eloise and we still know that the truth is scary in some way to Lyman. So there's this idea that, um, that it is dangerous and that maybe Lyman is guilty in some way and he's afraid of finding that out or something like that. TVD. Sorry. No, it's okay. It, it, be, it, it won't be quite so loud over here, hopefully. So. House tour. Yeah. Here's my living room. Yeah. All right. Um, so then we have um, the part that I really love, which is Lyman kind of starts rambling. He's kind of like starting to pass out, basically. And he's kind of like deliriously rambling. And he mixes all of these symbols. Um, and Richard is, is trying to literally like hold him to life says, uh, you know, as a physical force could hammer back the shutters closing on life and consciousness. And he says, you're not going to die, not until I'm ready for you. And Lyman says, don't be silly, Richard, coming from a great distance. For a moment, his quick mind cleared. He squinted at the darkening couple up with clouded eyes and then closed them with a wisp of a grin. God, I forgot, you don't like Glovers. Do you guys know why he says that then? You don't like Glovers? Yeah. Isn't he just teasing him about the whole going on the glove chase thing? That's what I thought. Yeah. Well, say it then. It's Is a grand thing to come out of. Like, um, so, I mean, obviously he thinks of something because it says his quick mind cleared. Yeah. And he closed it with a wisp of a grin. So, like, he's got, something's going on in his head, and then he says this thing that will um get Richard off on a different track so so this has been driving me crazy for literally years because I could not figure out why did Lyman say that at that moment um and in the uh June 2020 issue of Whispering Gallery which is the quarterly magazine about Dorothy Dunnett's works they have a section, they have this wonderful thing they do, the Dunnett lexicon, where they'll pick words and explain like how she used that word and why she used it there. And they explained why he said it, which is like, finally. Oh, an answer. Yes. Um, and so Glover, this is the thing, he's he's making the thing about, he's making a reference to Jamie Waugh and how right. uh, on, that, on that wild goose chase. Um, and the reason he says it then is he doesn't want to go traveling and, um, He'd rather Richard leave him there, so he's trying to like annoy Richard. But the reason he thinks of it in that moment, the reason it's relevant, is because he's looking up at the cupola, um, and uh, there is a specialized use of the word "glover," so specialized that I've only been able to find it in an explanation, an explanation of it in works about dovecots. Roofs of dovecots were usually conical with an opening in the top. Glover in this context refers to the lantern or cupola that sits above this top opening, which allows the birds to get in, but keeps the rain and most of the light out. So he's laying there looking up at the cupola, AKA Glover, and then he makes a pun about the Glover. Oh, Lyman. What? Quick witted rogue yes. you. 
And then I realized that she actually set up this pun in the first page of this chapter. She refers to the cupola as a glover. So the word is in there. Oh, that's funny. Yes. I learned so many words from these books. Yay. All right. She does. Look at that. But rock doves had found a way through the glover, the safest topmost nests. Um, and isn't it amazing that, you know, however many years since this thing uh, was written, there's still a quarterly publication and there's enough to say about it that I can learn new things from it. That is cool. It made me really happy. And it literally just arrived in June. Oh, wait, the one that, the one that answers this question just got to you? Oh, yep. Yeah. <laughs> that is really, I'm like, what, why does he say this? And then like a few days later, this, this thing arrived. And I, was I love like, oh. it. Yay, quarterly people. OK, so they move to the Dell. Um, so same question, why the Dell as a setting? Well, it seems so idyllic and, you know, set apart from the world. And it was almost like this fairy space. I mean, this little meadow and a cave with the overhanging like shelf thing they get some shelter and they can and there's a stream like I mean it really feels like a little fairy tale out of the world set apart space and I think it functions as that too like they have this section of the story where the two of them are set apart they're outside of other stressors and influence and the only thing that needs to happen is that Richard is helping Lyman heal and they have food and they have shelter and they have, and they're in nature. So they're outside of all of those metaphors about society and structure and expectation, like all of that's gone away except what they bring with them internally. And they're only surrounded by nature and what is essential and, you know, all of that, all of those metaphors. So don't forget they have fish. Plenty of fish. Right, they have fish, they have <laughs> rabbit, they have like, so they have food. They have food, they have shelter, and they're in nature. I just mentioned that because of the the wonderful sort of back and forth <laughs> conversation they have coming up. They had a big fish. <laughs> oh, this is brothers. Um, no, I, I love, I think you're completely right, Dee. It's like this interlude outside of society where they can reset. Um, and I also, it's interesting because structurally, this whole section is like an extreme close up. You know, we're just super focused on these brothers. We're not cutting back and forth to anything else. There's like one point where we have a brief respite at the most intense moment where we need to take a breath, but it's basically like just zero in on these two and focus on this relationship. And structurally, like functionally, this couldn't happen if, if Richard had taken him to say like, a farmhouse and there was a family and he was nursing him to health there or or if he'd taken him to you know i don't know a sympathetic lord nearby or something like that like this could never happen in any situation except them being isolated and away from society so. yep exactly okay so um we have then Lyman alone for a bit. He's getting a little better. Um, and he's wondering to himself, and of course he's quoting, is this fraternal charity or furious folly? What say ye? Um, so he doesn't know, because he was unconscious, he doesn't know at this point that Richard is healing him for the purpose of taking him to public trial and execution. Um, Richard comes back with the fish. They have their brotherly exchange about it. Um, and then, um, there's a little, there's a line that I like on 444, um, uh, Richard is saying he realizes that, um, well, they're, they're talking about the whole thing with the Glover, Richard realizes that Petey Little was working with Lyman, um, uh, how, he says, how dull of us not to connect the two, and Lyman says, how dull of some of you. Mm. Um, so Sibylla well, figured it out a long time ago. knew. And then he says, what a delicious smell. You nurse, you cook, do you sow? And Richard says, I reap. Um, 
which if we didn't know they were brothers, there's several witticisms that come out of Richard's mouth during this chapter where you're like, oh, that's, this is also Sibylla's son and this is Lyman's brother. Yep. Um, so then they have this, Richard is so nasty. Um, Lyman asked him about the, he's basically kind of ripping on him for having abandoned his country. Um, the country must miss you on the frequent occasions when you are absent. How long were you in prison for? And Richard holds up his palm and says, I was lucky no one could tell, could they? Which is awful. It's ripping on Lyman's scars from when he was a galley slave. Um, and then Lyman basically gives him a lecture on all the ways that he's failed his country in his rabid pursuit of Lyman, which we all agree with. We had the same conversation as we read these chapters. <laughs> Richard, get a clue. And this is also this list of things also shows that Lyman is a lot more aware of what's happening behind the scenes, which means he's been to talk to people. Just more proof that I have that, you know, Sibylla and him have been conferring this whole time. Yeah, he certainly has a lot of information about mm -hmm. what's going on. And she's probably not his only source. No. He's probably okay. got it. Well, he probably got some of it from Will Scott, too. Because yeah. there's the part about um, how he... Uh, you engaged Janet Beaton in a charming little conspiracy behind her husband's back and displayed an Im remarkable incapacity on the rare occasions when you did set foot on a battlefield. So, yeah. like, that's a very specific that I don't think a lot of people even knew about, that Richard and Janet were having that little conspiracy. So, Yeah, but I think he's got sources, like, that we don't know about. Yeah. There's just, he's just got people, <laughs> you know? I mean, I just feel like they're just... Lyman people like tucked away. <laughs> well, not let's not forget that Johnny Golo has been at Mid Culture for months. Mm -hmm. so, so there's plenty of ways they could be exchanging information. Yeah. Um, and and sort of so Lyman tells Richard off in a relatively constructive way. Stop, you know, abandoning your country. Step up. Um, and then Richard kind of bites back and rips on Lyman um, about uh, basically how he's just got a rabble of thieves and, and he gluts them with women and drugs and like clearly his opinion of Lyman is extraordinarily low. Um, and then Richard starts dropping hints about what's gonna happen next. Lyman- Wait, Where are you in the- uh, 444. Okay. At the bottom. Yeah. Um, so then Lyman, so yeah, the hint is until you can travel. And that's where Lyman says, Behold me in a state of suitably agitated inquiry, which is kind of this thing we would talk about Lyman playing a role. He's like, all right, mm -hmm. what? And Richard says, guess, because he's acting like a child. Um, and then at this point, Richard tells him his plan is to take him back to Edinburgh, have him put on trial, um, and basically, you know, publicly executed after being horribly shamed. Um, how does Lyman react to this? He's just, he's, he's sort of, like, he says, look, suspend the godlike poking for a minute. And I love the way that Richard keeps doing this fish thing. It's like, have some fish. <laughs> and then at the end of the scene, he, I mean, we get to the end of the scene, and hospitably, Richard closed in, have some fish. <laughs> he just keeps bringing this. Anyway, um, but he says, uh, suspend the godlike poking for a moment. In other words, stop acting like a child. Um, I thought you'd make a clean end of it, at least, even if it was pretty dirty going in the middle. You wouldn't come to any harm. No one expected me to live. Basically, he's just saying, why haven't you slit my throat? Like, I thought you were just going to kill me. Yeah. This he's, is going to be messy. Just don't make it messy. He's really upset about it. Yeah. Um, so he continues on this track with Richard. Um, you know, what, what the hell are you doing out of Edinburgh now? What reason had you to, to deprive Erskine of the support he had a right to expect? Um, so a lot of his, uh, his ways of criticizing Richard, they all kind of come down to, you know, what sort of uh, lead have you given anybody in the last six months? Um, basically, you're letting down your country. What does it tell us that Lyman picks this to rip on Richard about? But, but right before that, I think he says something really important where he says, um, Richard makes this snide comment about not 
being sure of the parentage of his children because of Marietta. And this they bring up the master again. So it's like Lyman has returned to this persona of being in charge. And even though he's completely devastated physically, and it says, that's what I mean, said the master slowly, your sense of values has broken down and you won't face it. I had some sympathy, some, for this idiotic pursuit of yours. I was labeled cur, and in the end I had to bark, not entirely your fault. But he basically, it's not even the whole country thing, like he's failing his country, which he is, but it's that you have lost your sense of what is right and wrong <laughs> and like and he's it's broken and you're and not only is it broken you're not facing that it's broken and yeah definitely um so what does it tell us about Lyman that this is what he this is what he's saying to Richard I mean, it just tells us that he's really been trying to do the right thing this whole time, that he's been on Richard's side. Um, he doesn't come right out and say it, but like, I've been doing all this for you. I read that specific sentence, I was labeled Kerr, and in the end I had to bark, not entirely your fault. I see that solely as the episode where he had to bark at Marietta when she came, uh, you know, from the jewels. Like, I had to bark at her, I had to tell her that you know, I did this so she would come back to you. That's how I read it. Well, also just, he's been labeled a traitor, labeled a, you know, deserter, labeled a murderer, labeled like all these, all of these labels have been put on him. And at some point to survive, he's had to take on some of that mantle of, of not necessarily evil, but I mean, like he's, leading a band of roving marauders, you know, <laughs> like, I mean, he wouldn't have done that if he hadn't been given all of these labels. So there's an element of him, like, there are choices he had to make that he wouldn't have made if he hadn't had those, those labels. Well, like, uh, but one of the, I think this is just emphasizing the fact that he's insightful and that he's willing to He's willing to put Richard's benefit above his own. And that includes telling Richard hard truths. Well, and I think it also, like we've seen how Lyman has gone out of his way to keep helping Scotland throughout all of this story that's been about clearing his own name. Still at every chance he puts his country first, including down to being willing to die to save his country. Um, and so he really, like you talked about patriotism as service, a sense of service to the greater good of your country. And he really cares about that a lot. And he sees the lack of it in Richard as this huge flaring red sign that Richard has lost the plot. How <laughs> this value that's so important. He has lost the plot. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Which I may have done once or twice during this book as well. Yeah, same. <laughs> There was some point that I definitely lost the plot. You guys have ended up with the plot of this better than like any first time reader ever. <laughs> well, we had your help, Laura. I also think it really helped that we were discussing it chapter by chapter. I think that super helped because we were able to sort of deliberately think through everything that was happening chapter by chapter, which I think most people don't do that as they read a book. So yeah. that definitely was a benefit that we had. I mean, like, yeah, every first time reader has such a hard time keeping the characters apart. Um, yeah. But because we would stop and talk about them. Right. We'd be like, wait, who's that guy? And, and, and for me, it was the locations. Like, where are we now? Like, I just, the, the characters I could figure out pretty quickly, but the, the locations, I was just like, wait, what castle are we in? What are we doing? I was. And they'll always refer to some event by where it happened. So unless you like wrote down what happened, what happened it's like really hard to be like, wait, what happened there? Harriet? What oh, were all the things that happened at Sterling Castle? Like, right. like uh, who? Who? Moss? What's that all about? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I do know that one. That's I where people died. But I didn't to begin with. Like, he, he died right after that, like five or six days after that battle. I do remember that one. Which is where Lyman was taken prisoner. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so. Um, 
Lyman can't really keep this argument going. He's too exhausted. He passes out, and Richard flicks a pebble into the stream and offers him some fish. Um, fish. Uh, yeah, so I have a fish every once in a while. There is well. some fan art of the scene with the fish that I can show you. <laughs> of course. Uh, you know, this is by the Nova Draws on Tumblr. Here's Richard. And here's Lyman in the sunlight. Uh, the fish. Aww. I love Richard's halo. Uh, um, okay, there is more fan art to come. I'm sure you guys can imagine there's a lot of fan art of this chapter because it's not only popular with me, it's popular with everyone who loves this book. Of course. Okay. So I love these next sentences describing them. Oh, the, 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 the sentence by sentence thing. And where it says, it was a tragic and annihilating war in which intellect fought naked with intellect and blows fell not upon the mind, but upon the soul. Like, oh. Um, this is also interesting because we don't, so Lyman has just found out that Richard isn't gonna just kill him cleanly, is gonna heal him to take him off to trial. I think at this point, Lyman's goal has changed. Um, Lyman's goal was to save Richard's soul um, and redeem like, I guess Richard's opinion of him. But now, like we have this line, the longing to kill became so overpowering that Richard had to blunder off to get away from the sound of his brother's voice, his hands murderers at his sides. This tells me that Lyman is, well, it even says it, Lyman is trying to goad Richard yeah. into killing him. Right. He knew none better what Lyman was driving him to do and he guessed why. Like, Ly the, the battle is not about I'm trying to beat you verbally it's about, I'm trying to force you to kill me, and the other guy's like, I'm trying to resist killing you so I can take you into <laughs> just long enough to heal up that I can take you to jail. And, and they kill you there. Yeah. Which makes yeah. me wonder what Lyman is saying. Is he still ripping on him about not being appropriately patriotic and serving his country, or is he getting more and more like personal? Like, what is he actually saying? Mm -hmm. I think I think Dunnett's really smart in not mm -hmm. giving us those scenes. Like why? Well, I think if it was just like a page, like two pages of Lyman being horrible to Richard and Richard being murderously angry at Lyman, like I feel like our it would just feel jarring into what we know about the characters right now. You know, and so I, I think it's it's neat that in two pair like two short paragraphs, she kind of skips over that part, <laughs> and we know it happens, but we don't actually see it in scene. So, um, so we then have this moment where a horse. Some horses ride by. Richard is in the middle of cleaning a rabbit that he's killed. He goes to quiet his horse and he leaves the knife behind. And when he comes back, Lyman is up, he's sitting on a boulder, um, and the knife is gone. Um, now um, we kind of get into our final climax of this confrontation where um, Richard decides this this is it I'm gonna I'm gonna break him like he's been trying to break his brother this whole time um, and he, and he sees I mean Lyman looks um, high strung to a shocking degree so this is not our calm you know over it all Lyman this is something else he accuses him of, of playing at inverted Robin Hood with his men I that yeah which is just like because he hasn't been doing an inverted Robin Hood. He's been doing an actual Robin Hood. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. Which we've caught on to numerous times. Yeah. So. Um, he also, he said, you know, Lyman did it for attention. Um, and we hear Lyman, like he, he's really pushing and Lyman, it, Lyman had no reserves of strength uh, to make the half crippled journey back to couch and clear thoughts. So he's, 
again, he doesn't have his normal defenses up. Um, and he, he doesn't want this confrontation. He says to himself, nay, brother, I will not dance. Mm -hmm. um, and then Richard goes on and accuse him, accuses him of missing the love of young boys and basically accuse him of kind of indoctrinating and seducing Will Scott. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is interesting and I want to go back to it maybe when we talk about their family background because I think there's an interesting thing going on with gender where Lyman is more feminine and Richard is more masculine. Lyman is more like his mother, Richard is more like his father. And I think part of the- Or at least Lyman let that part of himself be at the forefront because of his father, whether like he, but he did it intentionally. Like, yeah. Um, but it, it then becomes part of the suspicion that other men have of him, that he's not properly masculine and that therefore he could be doing God knows what deviant things. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think that this thing that Richard's accusing him of is not necessarily like, it's not necessarily about sex that he's talking about here. Cause like, and the love of young boys, of course you must miss that. Someone to relax with in a gracious way to twist and indoctrinate and shatter with the wild, delightful mutability of your moods. You must miss Will Scott and your women. What it felt like to me that he was accusing him here, what he's accusing him of is more about like manipulating and playing God with the emotions of people and seducing them in the sense that you have this like adoring group that is sycophant, like that plays the sycophant to you and, and just sucks up to your every need and, and you get your thrills through that as opposed to actual sex, although that could be part of it too. But it, it feels like he's accusing him of manipulating the people around him who are naive just to feed his ego. I think it's true. I definitely think the subtext of sexual demons yeah. is in there. Too. Oh, it's there. Sure. Yeah. Um, so when he says, and your women, Lyman asks, suppose we leave out the women. And this is where Richard finds his way to break his brother. Um, he brings up Christian Stewart. Um, you know, he says she was too trusting. Um, and he sees the, he sees the change in his brother's face, the fissure, the first break. Um, there's a line here that I just, is such a perfect use of words. It says at the very bottom of 447, a great pain of joy seized Richard's heart. A pain of joy. Like there's such different words and they don't, this doesn't really make sense, but it does. This is exactly what's happening. Like this is an evil joy that hurts, but is still a great joy. Like it's just so disturbing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, um, yeah, it's just, it's a perfect, um, why am I blanking on, I'm embarrassed as an English teacher. It's a perfect, um, My brain isn't working. It'll come. Darn it. You go to it later. We'll put it in the comments. It'll pop into your head at like 2 a.m. I know. It'll be 2 a.m. I'll be like, oh, that's what that thing was. Yeah. Um, so then he brings up um, Turkey Matt, of course, who died because of him. Um, and it says the, the level of denunciation gave the words a power that rolled like the thunder of Goddard Damarung through the meadow, which is like, I, I had to look it up, like Ragnarok, like the apocalypse. Um, and Lyman finally cries out, stop it, Richard, and gets to his feet. Um, and so then we have Lyman kind of staggering against the cliff behind him, holding himself up. And he says, it says, um, Richard watched the death of all the characteristic cultivated graces and spoke again quite close now, a stony and judging shadow. Um, and then this is where he asks about Eloise and Lyman doesn't answer. Final straw. It's like um, what he was culminating. He kept growing his argument to bring all these people up. 
knowing full well that he was going to end up with this. Um, and this is where he says, the only daughter and the finest child, the most vivid, the most eager, the most intelligent, by now cherished by her own lover with her own children in her arms. Once late at night when you were away, she told me, and then Lyman says, no, oh damn you, no. Um, so I think two things. One, we are talking about the truth and why the truth is scary and why the truth is hurtful. Something about this truth, once spoken, is going to be devastating. This is the truth you can't take back. Um, Richard then says, you wanted her burned alive, and she was. What did she say to Richard late at night, and why would Lyman have wanted her burned alive? No clue as of yet. I mean... I hope we find out. Yeah. I mean... Yeah, I know. So obviously you can't know um, yet, but you're probably very curious. Yeah. Um, do you have any thoughts on what it could be? I'm assuming perhaps Lyman and Eloise had some sort of falling out or argument before what actually happened at the convent, whether it was immediately before or maybe they were still estranged from it. And again, that might have something to do with Lyman's guilt for what happened to Eloise. But again, I have no real way of knowing. It's, it hasn't really been in the context of the book yet, so. Or that she knew something and told Richard and Richard assumes that Lyman would be angry enough about it to hurt her, but he wasn't. Like maybe he was angry, but he wasn't that angry. Um, but I don't think we know what it is. Oxymoron, by the way. There you go. Got it. Wait, what was an oxymoron? Wait, what was an oxymoron? The, pain, the joy that is painful. The joy. Yeah, so words that are opposite, but put together. Um, so then Richard says, you know, you wanted her burned alive and she was, why should you cringe over it now? And this is where Lyman is just broken. It says the guard was down. There was the face he yearned to see never again inscrutable. Never again would he need to wonder what lay behind the smiling mouth and the delicate malicious wit skull, flesh, and muscle, every fluent line and practice shade of Lyman's face betrayed him explicitly, and Richard swept into a major, a foreign dimension that was suddenly dumb. Um, having read this book and started out with Lyman with all of these defenses up and all of this acting and all of these facades, did it surprise you that we ended up with all of the facades stripped away? And was this what you thought would be underneath? I was not surprised. I mean, I thought, I was a little bit surprised that we got it so blatantly that that she took, that Dunnett took Lyman to the point where he was stripped down this far. I, I didn't actually think that we would get to see the character that way. But if if that next paragraph is what we're talking about where Lyman is saying like, why I made one mistake, who doesn't? But I despised men who accepted their fate. I shaped mine 20 times and had it broken 20 times in my hands. Of course, it left me deformed and unserviceable, defective and dangerous to associate with. Which by the way, as a self-concept, that's really sad. <laughs> like deformed and dangerous and, and unserviceable. Oh. Um, but what in God's name has happened to charity? Self-interest guides me like the next man, but not invariably, not all the time. I use compassion more than you do. I have loyalties and I keep by them. I serve honesty in a crooked way. I love that line. I serve honesty in a crooked way, but as best I, but as best I can. And I don't plague my debtors or make them aware of their debt. Why is it so impossible to trust me? And you can just almost see that, like that last line, like why is it so impossible to trust me as just this crying out to his older brother. Like I made this one mistake and I've been trying to fix it 
ever since. And like everything he's done has failed. Which I don't think is actually true. Like it hasn't actually failed, but but in his mind it has. And he's like, why? <laughs> D, I think the next time I play D and D, I'm gonna use that line instead of saying I'm chaotic good. I serve honesty in a crooked way. In a crooked way. It worked. Yeah, it does. There's this is such a rich part of the book. There's so much here. Um, I shaped my fate 20 times and had it broken 20 times in my hands. Um, so we're thinking about the past five years after whatever happened. How many times did he try to fix things in different ways and have it fall apart? Yeah. Um, and then when he calls himself deformed and unserviceable, uh, defeated. Oh. Like, bad. Like. And these words, unserviceable, defective, they're like, like Margaret Lennox called him a broken machine. Um, someone, Gideon, said he wasn't a broken machine, but there's in this like machine metaphor, and he's using these like machine words, like he's a thing that's broken and can't be fixed. Um, it's just well, horrible. If the purpose of his life is to be of benefit to others, like which maybe he sees that way and maybe he doesn't, but I think that that's part of his purpose is what benefit am I to others? Like how can I serve my country, my family? And so that self-concept of unserviceable and defective is it's like he's broken, like you're saying, he's, he's this broken thing that can't fulfill his purpose, which, ah. Um, then he kind of gives his Lyman manifesto of who he is, is. Um, and you can, it's really interesting to look at these lines and see them in this book. And this is also what, every time you're reading one of the subsequent books and you're like, what in God's name is this asshole doing? <laughs> you can go back to this section and usually figure it out. Um, so self-interest guides me like the next man, but not invariably. If we think about this in the book, right? He was going, he was looking out for his self-interest a lot of the time. He was trying to clear his name, but. Not all the time. Not all the time. He did a lot of things for other people. Um, he says, I use compassion more than you do. And this is interesting. Let's think about compassion in this book. Where does he use compassion? I think with almost everyone. I mean, with Christian, with Will, with... With even Agnes Harry's. Yeah, with Agnes, with Gideon and Kate. He tries to do it with Philippia, although she's not having any of it. <laughs> um, with the lady at the the ostrich house, I forget her name. Um, um, Molly. Molly. We, the like, only person we haven't seen him show compassion to is Margaret Lennox, and there's a clear reason why, so. Yeah. Or like random, like Lord Grey and stuff like that, like he doesn't care about that. <laughs> but even the, like even like, groups of like the Scottish lords and stuff like he's trying to save them from from various things and, and he, yeah. really, he really cares about the suffering of the Scottish people in this war he's trying to protect people mm -hmm. um you know he also like you said he serves honesty in a crooked, crooked way um this one is interesting too um I don't plague my debtors or even make them aware of their debt who are his debtors well, it's like, who owes him? Well, a lot of people. It's like everyone that he's helped owes him. But he doesn't, he doesn't go around saying, like, I saved you from this. You owe me. Mm -hmm. like, he doesn't do any of that. So he does all of this, this, this stuff that compassion drives him to do. He doesn't expect a reward for it. And he's not, he's not fixing things or trying to fix things or trying to help people out of a motive of personal gain um, other than his name. Like he's trying to get that, but 
of all of his debtors, who has he been helping the most in this book? Richard. It's totally Richard. He, everything he did was protecting Richard. The whole setup of attacking the castle was to protect Richard. This giving information to Richard in a way that would help Richard in the battles was helping Richard. Yeah. Sending Mariana back to him. It's trying to help Richard. Like, yeah. It's not his fault that Richard keeps screwing it up. Which he pretty much says. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I mean, which makes that next thing, like, he's like, why is it so po impossible to trust me? And Richard's like, you shut the door yourself. Like, oh. Yeah. Um, now, this is interesting because we have this transformation that's starting in Richard, although he's not consciously aware of it. Even the pain of joy was like the transformation starting, like, this is joy, but it hurts. Like, this isn't exactly what he wanted. And right. so that now we have, now that it had come, he recoiled from it, recoiled as Lyman turned and bearing his place to the light went on. So this is like the scene with Mariotta where she really wanted Richard to look, to look at her and pay attention to her. And then when he did, it was terrifying and awful. And she was like, oh, I didn't want that after all. This is like, it happens a few times in this book where you think you want something and then when you get it, it's not what you wanted. Um, Richard seeing his brother broken like this is not the joy that he expected. Mm -hmm. um, and so then this is the top of 449. Lyman gives this speech about their brotherhood that I just, it kills me and it makes me want to cry. And did I mention how much I love this chapter? It's so good. Sleep, do you want to read it? Uh, where would you like me to read from? Why should you think so? Why should you think so? Yeah. Why should you think so? Why assume me to be of such different stuff? We have the same blood, the same upbringing. What else is there at the end of the day that we can call our own? We're our father's prejudices and our sword master's dead men, our mother's palate and our nurse's habit of speech. We're the books unwritten by our tutor and our groom's convictions and the courage of our first horse. I share all that. Five years, even five such as these, can't tear me drop by drop from your blood. What did you guys think of that? I could talk about it forever, but I don't want to dominate this conversation. I mean, it was just this beautiful, we're alike, you and I speech. Yeah. No, Basically, we, we're family and we always will be, no matter what. And that we have come from the same place. Like, we've come from the same people. We've come from the same experiences. We've come from the same... And it, he ends it with this blood metaphor, which is family, like, we're the same blood. But um, but that's not actually the focus of the speech. Like, it's not the fact that they're brothers by blood that has made them from the same place. It's the fact that they share, like, their experience with their father, the experience with the sword master, the experience with the groom, the experience with the, it's like all of this life experience that they've had together. That's what I was going to say, too. It's not because they're related that their relationship is so precious. It's because of their shared childhood and their shared, shared experiences. It's not actually about blood. Um, and I had never thought of, um, I'd never thought of the way that people are made out of the experiences of the people that raise them, you know, and everyone continues on by raising the next generation and passing these things on like, you know, the groom's conviction, the nurse's habit of speech. It's not just your blood parents, it's your community and, and what you pick up from them. And it's such a like beautiful understanding of, you know, how, how communities function and how knowledge and, and just personality and everything is passed along. Yeah, and why are we, why is like being, bound together by experience important and yeah um so then uh richard again he's he's numb appalled um he reflects horror with horror so again not happy now that this is happening um he says who made you a murderer which i think refers to eloise um and then lyman tells him you know get out get free um, he's still trying to 
protect Richard, right? Um, Richard says, do you think my life is a matter for your tarnished and paltry conscience? And Lyman says, why else should I say what I have done? Meaning the reason he did this whole, and the way I interpret it, the reason he did this whole confession is not to clear his own soul, it's to try to reach Richard and try to redeem Richard's soul. Um, and then this is where Richard goes off and is just beyond the pale. Um, he, you know, you're crumbling and disintegrating and whimpering beneath the gut sucking evil on your back. And since there was no one else to whine to, no one alive to listen, no one to help, you dropped on your belly and crawled and writhed and crept whining to me. Um, which I think maybe Lyman sees this as, okay, there's no saving Richard. And also it's utterly devastating to hear it from his brother. So any, by any means. Um, there's no hope at this point. Uh -huh. like, it's, the, it's the darkest moment, you know, and yeah. So then Lyman still has that knife, tries to kill himself. Richard runs over and, and tries to stop him. Um, and basically, even though Lyman is so injured, he, Richard can't stop him. He's got this, like that, that strength of, you know, when like your child gets injured and you lift up a car, that extra burst of strength, but his focus is on killing himself and he won't be stopped from it. Um, and it says it was uncanny. Richard found it terrible. It froze his blood. Um, so again, this thing Richard thought he wanted his brother to break horrifying um and then as as they're struggling an astonishing light broke on richard um he sees lyman's lyman is unstoppable anger left him he framed the word no with his lips and then he he seeing that lyman's not going to stop he like knees him in his injury um which makes him drop the knife and scream. And he, and he basically, he screams at the pain of it. And then he just like, he screams and screams again. Like he's just out of control screaming. And it says right after this, he had to stop the scream with his hands. Like he was so out of control. He had to put his hands over his mouth to get the scream to stop. Mm -hmm. This is horrible. Any comments before we move on? Yeah. I mean, it's a little graphic. I mean, he has to sort of, the only way to stop him from killing himself is to re-injure him. Like all this work that he's done to try and fix this, he, he risks making things worse. But what's the alternative? Lyman will stab himself and it'll be the end, so. I will say, I wanted, I wanted a little bit more of Richard's thought process in this like because he so he's been lost in this passionate obsession for revenge for the whole book mostly and and he's been deep in the throes of that for the last half of the book or third of the book and we see glimpses like she's definitely setting up this change earlier in the chapter and we definitely see glimpses of him sort of trying like sort of his brain kind of working through this but we it's almost like a Saul on the road to Damascus moment like the light sort of shines on him and then all of a sudden revelation and he's like figured it out I just wanted a little bit more of like Richard sort of his logical mind coming back and him thinking through like what has happened. And I mean, the whole like light dawning literally um, was fine. Like I'm glad it did and I, and I loved that moment. And it certainly made this scene like super powerful. But I still wanted a little bit of Richard, like, thinking well, through this. This is interesting because I, I think it's super intentional. I don't think Richard's conscious mind is, is participating oh, at all at this point. No, I agree. It's super intentional. Like, 
done it, did it absolutely intentionally. I'm just saying I wanted to see it a little bit more. Like I, 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 it literally wasn't his conscious mind. This is an entirely, this is a decision of his id and his unconscious, and he can't. His conscious mind isn't thinking about it and doesn't know why he's doing it. Right, but for people like that, they're gonna have this insight, this this sort of epiphany. Like he has an epiphany, but then you go back and you think about like, okay, I've had this epiphany, so now I have to go back and think about all the stuff that I did. Like, why did I think what I thought before, and like, what was wrong about what I thought before? Like, that's how your brain works. So that's what I wanted from Richard was the post epiphany, like putting everything together for him, and I just wanted to see that more. But. I don't think he's had, I don't, how do I say, I think he's had the epiphany, but I don't think his conscious mind is even aware of the epiphany yet. Because I don't think he's aware until later. There's a scene later where he's preparing to go home. Yeah. I think he's just on autopilot. I don't think he yeah. even realizes until that, like, kind of breakthrough in that scene and in the dark with the wind where he's like, oh, yeah, I got to go save my brother. Yeah. But even then we don't get it. Like, I just wanted it at some point in the chapter, and I don't think we got it at any point in the chapter. So that's why, like, even at the end of the chapter, like, maybe after he talks to his mom, like, <laughs> at some point, I just wanted him to think through stuff and be like, wow, I was a, I was a real douche. Like, you know, and just kind of have that moment, but. He does sort of have it, not about Lyman, though, but he does with Marietta. Yeah, with Marietta. Sure. Um, did it surprise you guys that Lyman tried to kill himself? A little bit. I mean, I think Lyman has had this sort of anti-hero status through this this whole thing. And you would think that he would, I don't know how to phrase this. Um, I guess I'm just trying to say that I am a little surprised that he would try and kill himself. But if it's between that and, you know, facing up for what he's done, I don't think he stands, he doesn't think that he stands a chance if he goes back to Edinburgh, so... I think he's in such despair at this moment. Like, I was with Philippe. I was not expecting him to to try and kill himself, especially in this way. Like, I could have seen him, like, being willing to, like, waste away because he was telling Richard to leave him and just leave him to die. But um, I was not expecting him to, like, grab the knife and stab himself. But I also wasn't surprised. Like, I, th I think it had been set up logically like his despair has been pretty clear and it's pretty dramatic how how lost he is and how much he's despairing so i wasn't surprised by it but i wasn't expecting it either if that makes sense does it change your interpretation of any of his previous behavior not for me i mean maybe he was a little bit in a darker place more than I was thinking, but yeah, I don't think too much. It kind of, for me, like, I think we were right, you're right, he was in a darker place than we realized, because we saw him in the beginning through Will Scott's eyes. He's this outlaw, he's breaking rules and stealing gold and having adventures, but it, then we see all these moments where he's, like, getting drunk, um, and these moments where he takes dangerous actions and in particular the after he's kind of given up on getting to Samuel Harvey where he tries to sacrifice himself for Christian and then for the queen where this isn't just heroism and this isn't just drinking this is like this really traumatized person with a little bit of a death wish yeah yeah I, I guess I saw that he had a death wish that he was taking risks that were outsized but i don't think i i think reading back again i'll probably see it as more despairing than i than i did the first time did it surprise you in terms of genre no because i have a hard time with the genre of this book like it's <laughs> um it's going to, my, my definition of the genre of this book is going to be determined by whether he wins at the end or not. So, and how dramatic the victory at the end of this book is, if it exists at all. So we were talking about like Robin Hood and the Scarlet Pimpernel and 
this is why I love this book because it goes so much more deep and psychological than those stories. And in ways where I'm sure there's fanfic that does go to those deep psychological places, but she does it in the book. Yeah. Um, I'm still not a hundred percent convinced that he's going to win at the end. Like I'm more convinced by the end of this chapter. Cause I think things go, like things end up good in various ways by the end of this chapter. But I don't think it's a guarantee. Like, and most of the time, by the time I get to this part of the book, I'm like, oh yeah, this is gonna happen. You know, yeah. like, I feel like as a savvy reader, you can kind of figure out what's gonna happen in a book. In fact, you know in the first chapter, like you know where a book is going because you've read so, because of a genre. Like you've read so much in a genre and you know, you know what's gonna happen. And I don't feel like that's actually true in this book in a way that's interesting. Yeah. I, I have to agree. And I think part of why I loved it so much is because I read so many books. I'm so used to like, you know, I know what's going to happen. Yeah. So having that experience of like, wow, like I have no idea what's going to happen. She's surprising me. She's keeping me on my toes. Like yeah. for a very experienced reader, it, this is this so rich and thrilling to find something like this. Yeah. And it's really, like, I find the unsurprising aspect of a lot of genre fiction to be very comforting. Like, I, I love the comfort of reading something and knowing exactly where it's going and, you know, recognizing all the characters and, like, I, I, that repetition to me is super comforting. And I'm unsettled in a lot of ways reading this book. Not in a bad way, but in a, in a, um, like, the plot not the plot but the just the the threads that go through the plot are in some ways unfamiliar which is nice <laughs> i have to say i found the section comforting because it told me that dorothy dunnett as a writer is interested in the same things that i am interested in as a reader mm -hmm. so no matter what else she's going to surprise me with i know she's going to go for these like deep rich psychological situations but it's not comforting to me in the way that like that repetition of the same thing over and over and over and over again is comforting to me because this is not the same thing over and over. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, I'm still not sure exactly where we're going. So um, it is, it, it's, it was, it was also really appealing to me because I'm so used to kind of picking around the margins of things to find what I'm interested in. Like on Buffy, I was super interested in Spike, but the people writing that show weren't really interested in Spike. And in, um, in Game of Thrones, I was super interested in Jamie Lannister, but George R. Martin is like not that interested in him relatively. Um, but here it's like, oh, I'm super interested in Lyman and Richard and so is Dorothy Donut. And this is just everything I ever wanted out of this story. Okay, so. <laughs> Um, Richard, uh, well, no, sorry, at this point, um, Richard picks up the knife, he backs away, Lyman has stopped this awful screaming with his hands, um, he's, he's, his breath is sobbing in his lungs, the blood is welling through the bandages, um, and Richard calls him Francis for, I believe, the first time in the entire book. I think so, because I, I read that and I was like, whoa, that's a which uh-huh suddenly he goes back to their childhood right like yeah. it's, it's, it's that return to them as boys yeah. where he probably went by francis yeah suddenly he's not this at a remove of his title or his land this is my little brother francis um richard says i can't let you take my your own life um, Lyman takes his hands away from his face and it says the blood was everywhere now, his torment of grief public, uncaring. Um, so he's been completely stripped and he's, his grief is completely public. And this is the same Lyman who couldn't stand to have Kate's servant like help him take a bath. Like I keep the walls up, no one gets to see me vulnerable. So he's just, this is the worst, it must be so awful for him. Um, and he, then he, he asks if he has to plead meaning you know you claim your right of execution may i not exercise mine so he's pleading with richard to let him kill himself mm -hmm. um and you know could all the chains of three outweigh what i already bear or all the tollbooth's pains be worse than this so like the the he, he just wants to die the suffering is so over the top and intense um and he begs 
Richard. And then Richard has that memory of his line to Marietta. He said, I will bring him to you on his knees and weeping and begging aloud to be killed. And Richard just gets up and walks away. So again, be careful what you wish for because it might not actually be what you want. Um, And then he goes back in this this set apart place that they've been in is I, I love that it, there's this description of the place again it's like this the clearing was empty it was no longer a sanctuary he knew but the antechamber to a solitary a desperately wanted death and it was that beautiful beautiful dell that was there a little interview of safety um this really, uh, this surprised me to see our unflappable hero begging for death. I was again, like kind of overwhelmed. Um, so at this point, our emotions are so much that we take a little interlude to some stuff that is not gonna stress us out. Tiny breather here. Um, and- A little bit of a shock though. Like I'm, I had some whiplash going from <laughs> Going from the, the Richard thing, and then all of a sudden we're talking about Scotland, England, and France, mm -hmm. and ships moving around, and I was like, whoa, what? Yeah, we've been in this Dell so long with these brothers, we yeah. forgot there was an outside world. Yes, it's, it's like when you step out of a dark room into sunlight, and you're like, wait, what? What is happening? I think it's, it's similar, but not the same as Shakespeare's strat strategy, where he'll have, like, the porter show up before they find... Duncan's body, so they'll have a little bit of comedy or the grave digger right before a super intense scene. So you just like take a breath. Remember the porter. Um, so, so anyway, so then we get this political stuff that, like, let's be honest, we don't care at this point. Um, but I, I really didn't, to be honest. You're right. I know. I was like, blah blah blah. Oh. Like North Gray, the French. I was like, ships are going. Whatever, they're gonna go get the queen. Blah blah blah. I think that's the most important part that happens here is that the plan to get the queen by sailing around the north end of Scotland is in effect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a yeah. little bit and later. The Scottish play. Parliament met and they gave their consent to the queen marrying the Dauphin and they're gonna like provided the King of France like protect Scotland and like blah, okay, whatever. Um, the slightly interesting character stuff here is uh, is uh, Will Scott kind of interrogating uh, Erskine about why did you leave them together? Um, and Erskine's answer, um, because my name isn't Crawford any more than yours is. Also, I have two questions about this little scene that were unanswered. One is Scott said suddenly, I met Lady Douglas yesterday, George Douglas's wife, she said, and then he got interrupted. So I was like, what did she say? <laughs> and then second, he broke off as a peer, his black hat at a rakish angle jabbed Erskine in the back. My God, old slovenly blah, 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 blah. I said, blah, blah, blah. Okay, w where was that supposed to be someone that we were supposed to know? Like this, this peer who? No, I think this is just, yeah. kind of, I think this line is just telling us that, that like people in Scotland are wondering where Richard disappeared off to. Okay. Um, the Lady Douglas thing, I don't know. I haven't thought about that. What would Lady Douglas be talking about? What would you say that Will Scott thought was important enough to tell Tom, but then he gets interrupted and they don't go back to it? Like, so Lady Douglas was George Douglas's wife, who the English had captured along with Christian and then let go. Um, and I guess it was, she was let go to convince George Douglas to go back to the uh, English. Maybe uh, it was something about Christian? I don't know. It would have been something about Christian while they maybe, were- Maybe it was nothing, but any, I, I feel like Dunnett has kind of primed me for any time I have a question about something, I'm like, what was that? <laughs> so, like I've got this, I've got this system where I put little question marks on the part margins and then if the question gets answered later in the chapter I go back and cross out the question mark and then I just see how many question marks I'm left with at the end and these two question marks were not crossed out so. Well how about this if any of our YouTube visitors know what Lady Douglas uh, said to Will Scott that he almost told uh, Tom Erskine leave a comment and let us know because I don't remember it's probably something that shows up. And if it's nothing it's nothing like it could be me just being overly sensitive to 
<laughs> it's like, um, wait, was that a clue? Uh, all right. Now we go to my we're all, Yes, we're back to the brothers, and we're back to my <laughs> my favorite part of this entire book and maybe even series, um, which is Richard's subconscious breaking through his conscious mind. Um, and everything about this is perfect. Um, so I'll read a quote and then I want you to tell me why I read it, what, why it helps set the scene. Um, it was the cavorting and immalleable wind boiling through the rowans and sifting the junipers and baying eagerly through the lute-like caves and chasms that chivied Lord Coulter into proper thought again that night. Why, why that description of these plants and caves and chasms? What is that metaphor for? Well, I mean, the, he's been lost in this obsession and passion for months and perhaps longer. And he's been wandering in the wilderness, if you will, of, you know, obsession. And he's in the dark. Like he's been wandering in the dark in the wilderness and it's his, like him figuring this out is pressing on him and pushing him to get out of the dark, to get out of this wilderness. And I think it's also like, it's, it's almost like literally his, this, uh, you know, the wind is blowing and there's all these like trees and it's like, it's like the, the wind is blowing through his subconscious. It's this sort of in, in the nature of his mind, in the caves and caverns of his mind, something is stirring. His subconscious is woken up again. He, he's not consciously aware of it yet, but it's going to break through. There's the, all this activity in his subconscious that's happening at this primal level. Yeah. And he can't, it's like he can't, once he's woken up, once he's had this epiphany, this light has dawned earlier, there's no going back. So he's being pressed through all of this caves and trees and the wilderness. Like he's being pushed through the wilderness of figuring this out and can't, he can't go back, he can't let up, can't, you know. Although he's trying, he's, he's like, trying to ignore it. He's, he's like thinking about, you know, going back to mid Coulter and like, making plans for like taking care of the land and random stuff right he's in this like numb autopilot state yeah. um this is what his logical mind is doing but his subconscious is having this whole other experience yeah and i love this like his thoughts it, this idea of his thoughts are dividing so like the thoughts divided and became 20 and he divide he defied them for 30 seconds before recognizing the childlessness childlessness of the impulse Facts. Full stop. Yeah. Um, and it's hard to respect them. What were they? Yeah. And it's also like he's got this whole thing about going back, but then he's also got these thoughts coming in from his subconscious and he's formulating this realization. Like, I've had these experiences where I woke up from a dream and realized I had decided something that I had been. I had no plans to do and then I'd wake up and be like wow my subconscious figured this thing out and now I know for sure that I'm going to do this thing um and that always every time that happens that just blows my mind because it's so weird to realize you have this whole other part of you that you don't even consciously control and yet it's making these major decisions for you and figuring things out while you sleep um yeah. and like that's what's happening to Richard here yeah but here is this moment where it was kind of like what I was asking for earlier. Like there's a little bit of it here where he's saying like facts, he was bred to respect them. What were they? So he's like, okay, what are the facts? You know, like now that he's sort of climbed out of this obsession wilderness, now it's like, okay, what are the facts? So the, here are the facts. The graceless, desolate, the debauched, the insolent, the exquisite Lyman was obliterated. So this, this, concept of his brother that he had that was false is gone and so now as he intended he had broken his brother he had indeed been more merciful than he had intended and i was like well he didn't kill him and he didn't take him to be executed publicly so he let him go die which is what he wanted that technically is more merciful than what he intended right but now he's left with like what is he left with is, is the question. So if he's, if he's looking for facts, 
And he's obliterated this like shell of Lyman that Lyman shows to the world and he's destroyed that. What are the facts that he's left with? When he's thinking of, the things he's thinking of are, they're, they're cold and empty things. The cold house in Edinburgh, his mother's face. This is his mother's face after he's left his little brother to die. Um, his estranged wife, Erskine's sharp and speculative gaze, Buclew's un uninhibited stare, the court where he'd be under censure. So all these like, you know, all these other people are not really, it's not a good thing to kill your brother or leave your brother to die. And all of these things have their cold, there's like this cold emptiness. And part of that is probably because they'll be judging him, but part of that's also because he's gonna be judging himself and knowing that he left his brother to die and how's he gonna face these people? Yeah, yeah. Um, then, we, then we get this part that I love, that something unused and ritual at the back of Richard's conscious mind stirred. And he stared into the buffeting darkness, quickly denying it. But also right before that, even before that, the mare's skin was warm. Like he's touching this warm horse. Like there's something so, uh, you know, you hug your pet when you need like to have this emotional connection and his fingers tighten and he thinks about his brother screaming. Like there's something really primal and youthful about, you know, a child holding their, their horse, you know? Mm -hmm. Keep going. Yeah. And then Francis screamed. Right. So then he has this, like, this thing is coming from the back of his head. And then he immediately <laughs> starts thinking about, like, the practical problems of his estate. <laughs> and he's like, there's this unconscious thing that's coming up. Like, Francis had screamed, and he's thinking about that. And then he's got this something in the back of his head is starting to, to come forward. And he's like, well, let's think about how did the sheep go? What do I need to do about the water? And I should do some things for the men. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like all of this like practical stuff that he had been distracting himself with like we saw that earlier that he uses that practical stuff to sort of fill his life so he doesn't have to deal with things I think um but all the time the stiff jointed thing at the back of his mind was flexing its subconscious limbs and shaking its aged neck and rearing nearer and nearer his waking mind. Ah, that's so it's good. That's the best thing I've ever read. I just think it's so brilliant. So good. You get this image of this thing like waking up. <laughs> yeah, and it's 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 this ominous primal subconscious thing, but it's also stiff jointed because it's been sleeping. It's actually his brotherly love. It's just this like good person that's inside of him. And it's kind of like this really negative description of this thing that's actually quite good, which is interesting. But it's scary because it's yeah. beyond your control, you know? It's this, this aspect of yourself that you can't stop. Yeah. Um, and then this is back to the, um, the, the trees and the landscape as a metaphor for what's happening with him. As, the, as this thing is lurching forward in his consciousness, the wind sprang among the young trees, persecuted beyond reason and ash high above them, lurched heaving to its feet and crashed behind Bryony. Um, and the mare leaped whinnying and shaking under Richard's idle hand. So the, the nature is, is like happening in parallel with this breakthrough in his consciousness of, you know, something he, he hasn't, he still isn't even consciously articulating. He's just feeling this instinct. Um, you know, this block of sensation held so insecurely in check broke its bar and blundered into the forefront of his mind. Um, it gripped him as he pulled down and soothed a mare beyond proper analysis in its man's infant fear of the irretrievable, a starved yearning for warmth, a childish speck of uncluttered vision, a tight and tangled warp of reason and emotion became suddenly an obsessive compulsion. So even here, he's not like, I have consciously decided that I am going to go rescue my brother because it would be bad to let him die and I would be sad. Yeah. It's more just this absolute compulsion that he still isn't consciously understanding. He's just literally strikes off through the darkness, plunging through the forest um, in the direction last taken by his brother. Yeah, letting reason fly like a hag through the night wind. Because actually reason would be like, just leave him there. 
I mean, the whole abandoning sense of it, like he abandons all of this purpose that he had. And I love that image of letting reason fly like a hag through the night wind. It's like, whoa. Um, if you've ever wondered what a complacent dumpster is, it's a judge in Scotland is a dumpster. One thing that was interesting here though, is that like, so reason is being like, Dunnett is personifying reason as a, like a horrible witch, like a night hag, a monster that flies through the night. But it's been Richard's lack of reason the whole time that's been causing problems. Like the fact that he got obsessive about Lyman and didn't stop to think, didn't stop to, you know, really ponder what was go really going on. He just let his emotions drive him through the whole story so far. So it's so interesting to me that like, it's emotion that is, like resetting him almost, you know, like going back to childhood and that that um, return to their relationship that they're sort of kind of getting a glimpse of here. Um, and reasons being personified as this kind of horrible thing that flies through the night. So it's, it's kind of interesting. I don't know. I wonder, I mean, it, it tells you something about humans it also tells you something about Richard that he's a person very driven by emotions even though he doesn't think he is um, but I think it's also very and they, they say you know look at advertising most things we decide aren't decided based on logic they're decided based on these more primal compulsions that humans have like most of what we do isn't because we consciously con contemplated it um, but I think also it tells us like Richard is Richard, like most humans, has this in his like primal way, has this terrible, sadistic, dark side, but he also has this beautiful, you know, I love my brother and I want to protect him side. So like most people, he's a combination of good and bad and uh, finally his uh, his good side is waking up again. Yeah. On. So um, he goes plunging through the forest um, and he finally finds his brother in a deep and unlikely form at the foot of a meager willow. Um, willow has something to do with like rebirth. Um, so I think that's why she chose a willow. Um, it's not a heroic picture. Um, Lyman himself lay in a tangled abandonment of blood and bruised greenery and torn cloth, unruly, filthy, and emphatically severed from society. So this Lyman, who's so neat, and even after being tortured at three, he was, you know, all cleaned up again in the next scene, just beyond anything. This is the lowest point we've seen Lyman for the entire book. Like, at, at this point, he is the closest to death as well. Like, it's that, the absolute worst he can get, I feel, without actually dying. And not just physical death, but he's just withdrawn from the yeah. world and is emotionally like ruined. I mean, severed. as we've seen, he's next severed from society, which is cut off. He, in the next segment, he doesn't even communicate. He just uses his eyes for like the next two, I think it's two or three days before he finally does communicate. So. Well, and he doesn't even communicate with his eyes. He just like stares blankly and flinches when Richard comes near. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which is a fanfic trope. Because isn't there like, there, there's some epic Spike and Xander story of, you know, 130 pages. Oh, yeah! Yeah. The but, one like, that's like, catatonic. Like, Spike is catatonic or something. Yeah, it goes on for like 50 million chapters and and Xander's like way out of character. Yeah. yeah. This is definitely, this is why I say this is, this book is made out of tropes. This is a fanfic trope, um, but she writes it so beautifully and it mm -hmm. just gets to your soul. Um, so Richard's looking at his brother and he's imagining when Lyman wakes up that he's gonna be grateful that Richard saved him. Um, but then what actually happens is not surprise or relief, but a dissolving horror. Um, and he sort of fades away into recoil. And then when Richard comes near, near him, he flinches. And otherwise, he just stares 
um, you know, motionless, the eyes opaque and open, the mind incurious, inanimate, unaware, except for the terror which sprang into being when Richard appeared. Mm -hmm. So basically catatonic. And then there's this wonderful line of like Richard coming to terms with what he's done in some ways where it's like, it says, um, the only thing living within the other man was the memory of a fear. But then he says, you chose to play God and the deity points out that the post is already adequately filled. And it's just like Richard is, that was not my place, <laughs> you know? And I love that the deity points out the post is already adequately filled. Yeah, um, I think also part of the reason this is so effective, Lyman being so broken and our heart go going out to him is because he was so capable and confident and heroic and unstoppable before. Like this trope in fanfic often doesn't work for me at all because it's like, these characters are just pathetic and you, you don't care. But with Lyman, because you know how strong he is, you know, like, my God, he's been pushed really far. Like, at least for me, I greatly empathize with him. Yeah. And I like that Dennett, like, she's, she's brought both of these characters down, like, strip them to their core. And, and then she's, she's building them up again, I think, from this point. I think, Philippe, you were right about, like, it's the darkest moment, but not just for Lyman, also for Richard. Like, they're, they've gone sort of down to the depths, and now the author is going to build them back up again. And so like that next paragraph, we get Lord Coulter was a strong and honest and stubborn man. He made his decision and laying a finger on the one thread anchoring Lyman to reality proceeded to twist it into a rope. So now we get this like intentional Richard is determined and he's honest and he's stubborn and he's strong and he's going to Save he's gonna save his brother and yeah, yeah. It's um, how, so i love how adamant lyman is to not accept that help <laughs> yeah like least of all from his the, brother the tables have turned here so uh, one thing i think is interesting is this is the lyman chronicles but which character changes more at least so far in this book lyman or richard and so far richard He's yeah. had a huge change. I mean, you think, I don't think Lyman has necessarily changed much because from what we've seen in the beginning, we already knew that that was a front. Whereas here we have Richard making an honest choice to do something differently right. than he has been. Yeah, 100%. It's really, you know, Lyman's motivation this whole time was to save Richard. And for us as the reader, we thought we were reading about Lyman, but actually it's really Richard who is going through the biggest transformation. Yeah. At least so far, I won't spoil you for the last chapter. I mean, so like Lyman still the, is the protagonist of the novel, but his character, I think Richard has at least up to now a more dynamic character in the sense that dynamic meaning change. Like Richard's character Changes. has changed more than Lyman. Well, and for Lyman, the trick is that he doesn't change, but he's revealed to us. So we are always learning more. Yeah. So um, Richard uh, finds the, uh, the thread and he twists it into a rope to keep his brother alive. So Lyman is laying there vacant um, and Richard starts talking about their shared childhood, um, which uh, it's just beautiful. And it goes right back to that speech Lyman gave about how they are made of the experiences that they grew up with. So these are the things that Richard uses to connect with him. Um, and again, it, it's um, Lyman isn't responding, but Richard is very stubborn. Um, so he keeps going. Uh, you know, he goes again the next day. Um, he's leaving out like sort of anything that's going to be like stressful current events. He's focusing on their childhood. Um, and he starts going down a, a pathway where he mentions their father. Um, totally affirmed everything I thought about their dad. Yeah. Like, I was like, yeah, that's the kind of guy that I thought he was. Like, 100%. Um, what did, why did you think it was going to be that way? What, what were the hints? 
I mean, part of it was, again, the trope of, like, I feel like in some ways it's the cliche of the hyper-masculine father, the oldest son who's desperately trying to live up to his father's ideas, the younger son who doesn't fit in, you know, doesn't live up or doesn't fit in and clings to his mother in other ways and yet, you know, is still brilliant and all of that. Like, so in some ways it's this cliche family, but I think as you've been saying all along, like Dunnett does it in a richer way. Like she does it in a more, it feels visceral, it feels more realistic. But at the same time, those things are recognizable. Like you can see in Richard and Lyman's relationship, the, the jealousy at the core and the, um, maybe not the core, but there's more at the core that's better than that. But, but that there is jealousy in their relationship, that there's an attempt to please their parents and a failure to please, or and a perceived failure of pleasing their parents. I think in their father's sense, it was a real failure to please. Like their father was clearly not nice. Yeah. It, like we're damaged by our parents. We all are. Like somebody once said that the best thing you can do for your kids is start a savings account for therapy. Like, because everyone damages their children. <laughs> but, um, but I think their father was particularly heinous in, in some of his. Oh, well, yeah. He had no interest other than sports. He couldn't tolerate anyone who had. He burned a case of books that Sibylla got. Um, not good. <laughs> that was particularly heinous. Um, and I, I like how this. Richard goes down this memory pathway and then it makes him start realizing things about their childhood that he hadn't realized before. So one thing he notices is that he realizes that the voice was Lyman was using with him is the same voice Lyman would use to retort when his father was being shouting, being abusive. Um, but suddenly he's got this view of like Lyman in a different light and himself in their father's role. Um, and then he also starts thinking back to um, how he says he was an adolescent before he suspected that his younger brother was less of an effet brat than his father made out. So you have this yeah. realization that the father was awful to Lyman and made him out to be this, but also that, um, well, were you gonna say something? Well, yeah, it's like, it's clear that his father, their father pitted them against each other. like their father deliberately made Lyman out to be less to Richard in an attempt to keep them apart. Like that he was deliberately driving wedges in their relationship. And Richard is only now, like he says he was an adolescent before he suspected that his brother. So he, he figured out when he was a teenager that his brother wasn't what his father said but I don't think he really figured out his father's role in some of this until right now. Like, I feel like this scene is him figuring out some of that stuff. Well, and he says, you know, Lyman submerged himself in his filthy tongue in music and books and Sibylla abetted him, why? And like Richard thought at the time that it was like a way of mocking him. Mm -hmm. um, and he kind of realizes now that it wasn't about him. It was just that, um, you know, Lyman, seeing how abusive his father was, was just turned away from him and, and like, didn't try to get his approval and was just focused on the, you know, music and books and the stuff that, that his mother liked and that they had in common. Yeah. Um, well, and also I love that bit where he might have taken a satirical pleasure in avoiding their father's approval. So like you can see young Lyman in Richard's mind, like the only weapon he has against his father is aggressively not seeking his favor and like doing, like not being the boy that his father wants him to be is the way that he's pushing back against his father. Like even if he is good at some of that stuff, you know, like he's, he's 
acrobatic and he's he is actually physically and he's an app he's a good athlete but he's sort of aggressively not being those things um and and richard realizing like oh wait it wasn't about me um what effect must it have had on lyman that his father rejected him like this i mean what effect wouldn't it have it would it would be devastating to a kid to like this is the person who's supposed to be the one who shows you the world and teaches you how to be who you are and you know the fact that half of your parental structure affirms you doesn't make up for the fact that the other half is horrifically abusive and cruel I think it probably also speaks to why Wyman is so hurt and so sensitive to Richard's rejection because he's already been rejected by his father. And so when it happens with Richard, it's just a knife in an already like wounded place. Um, so Richard keeps talking about these childhood things and then he, he kind of like hits his limit. He kind of grabs Lyman and shakes him and says, I'm sick of taking care of you. How about you make an effort? Um, and then Lyman finally responds, um, and he kind of, you know, he says, you can't force me to live. Um, and Richard tries to push him and, and Lyman just kind of like, like briefly is animated and then he just kind of like breaks again. And it's just like, you can't make me go. I can't go, you know, I can't now. Um, and Richard, to his surprise, he hasn't decided consciously even at this point, to his surprise, he found himself shouting that he's not going to take his brother to Edinburgh and that he's actually going to heal him and let him free. Um, and, and Lyman, like, literally can't grasp it until, you know, Richard just basically shakes him and is like, you are not going to the gallows, I'm going to save you. Um, which is, I think, yeah, one, it's amazing, but two, like, he still didn't consciously know this is the point where he realizes it. And it even says right after this, for the second time in a few days, Richard Crawford had made a momentous decision purely on impulse. Like this is so primal. I love the way she tells the story. Yeah, and it makes him uneasy. He's like, yeah, it's like it, the prey it made him feel uneasy, the prey of dark and avatavistic. Atavistic. Please. Atavistic? Atavistic. Caprice. And he's like, he didn't like that. He likes being logical and systematic and thorough. And, and he says, but I'm thinking it over more or less all night. He found he regretted nothing. And that's the bit I wanted a little bit more of. I just wanted the taste of that night of him thinking it over and realizing, like, I made the right decision. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted a little bit of his wrestling with that because obviously he was wrestling with it and it kept him awake all night and that's the part that i was like oh i wanted a little more so it's interesting because it tells us how again how driven by instinct richard is once he makes up his mind he's like really set on this course even though logically lyman has not explained everything richard is like nope i'm gonna save you this is what i've decided <laughs> but he had it really like i would push back on that because it says thinking it over more or less all night. Like he stayed awake for like eight hours wrestling with, do I regret this? Do I not regret this? Am I making the right decision? Am I not making the right decision? Like what's going on? And then he's like, by morning, he's like, okay, I don't regret it. I'm making the right decision. But it wasn't like he made the decision quickly, but he wasn't comfortable with that decision quickly. And I can like that. I'm intrigued by that. I like that he thought it over so long. Yeah. But I think it tells us about him that he made the decision and then thought it over. Right. Right. He wasn't going back on the decision. He was just uncomfortable with having made it. And yeah. So the odd thing was that Lyman believed him without question, which is also interesting. Why does Lyman believe him without question? Yeah, it's odd. Yeah, he's been reacting so much. Yeah. Um, I like the fact that she draws attention to the fact that it was odd. <laughs> I'm like, yep, that, that is odd. Mm -hmm. I think Richard thinks it's odd. I, I, yeah. I, I, I mean, I think it tells us stuff about Lyman. It's like something in Richard convinced Lyman and he like believes in his brother again. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's also that or die. Honestly. But he wanted to die. He and wants he wanted to die. To die but maybe just that small glimmer of hope is all that he needed to sort of make the decision. Okay, I'll live instead. 
because he knows at this point he's not facing trial. He's going to go back and right. Richard's plan is to secret him out of the country as soon as possible. Yeah, yeah. But he believes them, which is impressive because Richard could have faked it, but I think Lyman also knows Richard can't fake it, which we'll talk he about. He definitely isn't going to fake it. That's not really Richard's boat. If he was going to fake it, he would have, like, lied his way through to Lyman way earlier than this. Well, yeah, I mean, this entire book is predicated on Lyman's assumption that Richard can't fake anything, so. Yeah, right. Otherwise, he just tell him at the beginning. Yeah. Um, <coughs> so then this is super interesting. Lyman reveals that he actually showed up a few years ago, and their dad chased him away with a whip. Yeah. So, you know, Richard's like, why didn't you tell us? And he's like, I tried. Um, yeah. Well, it's like the first of the assumptions that Richard made about Lyman in, in these five years. Like, the first assumption that he makes is that he didn't come back. Yeah. And Lyman's like, well, no, he did come back. And, yeah. But also interesting is Lyman says he thought Richard knew. So this whole time, he's been thinking that they knew he tried to come home and they rejected him. Right. But actually, they, they had no idea. So again, like, the whole, your whole perception of what happened changes along with what they think happened changes with this yeah. And I would imagine Sibylla doesn't even know as well. Right. Yeah. Like it's something the father never told any of them. Yeah. And I love this exchange where he's like, I wouldn't touch you. You know that. In other words, like, I was going to let you go. Like, I wasn't going to pursue you at all until the mid culture affair. <laughs> and I was like, I know, you damn fool. Like, that's, that's why I had to do it. That's why I did it. <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> and then Richard's like, it's his Lord culture set up. And Richard's like, what? So <laughs> this. This is really funny because it's like, the, when you first read this book and you're just like, what the hell is going on? If you go back and read it now, it's all really obvious. The uh, first thing that Lyman hears when he shows up back in Edinburgh is these, these guys, Mungo Tennant and Tom Erskine and Baklu, gossiping about how L Scotland is threatened because they can't trust a bunch of the lords who are on the fence between Scotland and England, and they can't trust Lord Coulter because he won't pursue his brother who's a traitor. Right. So immediately, Lyman has to... The, like the first information he gets is your brother is it under suspicion it puts him in danger it puts the country in danger you have to take action to get your brother to at least make a, a visual appearance of going after you so that it'll help him in the country so that in order for you to be active and clear your name you can't just be cavorting around the country putting your family at risk your brother has to show that he's against you right yeah and then, <laughs> then richard's like or richard's like well you set fire to the castle <laughs> and it's like you idiot like I could do a better job than that. But you stole all the silver. <laughs> He's like, and I gave it back to mom. Yep. <laughs> Which I love how he says, she didn't tell you I expect because she knows what a filthy bad actor you actor are. You are. <laughs> exactly. Not got it all back the next day. And we know that Lyman and Sevilla are definitely good actors in this yeah. family. And I love this Richard stare was embarrassingly concentrated. <laughs> like He's like, you can just see him going, Oh. Okay. 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 But wait, what about this? I'm like, what's that chance? <laughs> and then he's like, oh, that. But I love that Richard has made his decision before all this. He made the decision on brotherly love, not on the logical explanation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so then also, Lyman screwed up um, by stabbing Janet Beaton and by flirting with Marietta because he had to get himself drunk in order to work up the nerve to go to even go home. Which just, one, it breaks my heart, too, if you go back and read that scene, suddenly it's a completely different scene. Yeah. Um, so then they kind of talk through, um, you know, Lyman's sacrifice uh, at Hexham. Uh, Richard is, like, seeing the heroism of his brother. Um, and then Lyman kind of changes the subject. He's got to whine for 10 minutes. He's not whining. He's just explaining himself. But he sees explaining himself as whining because he has some sort of complex that like of like self-hatred and not being willing to tell the truth because he sees it as whining which is just explains why he doesn't ever explain himself but it's also like dude you're not whining okay i was confused at this next bit because lyman was also confused and i didn't quite figure out like a why it's confusing and b why lyman was confused so he says francis did you ever tell will scott how old you actually are lyman looked blank he's like huh and he says no should i and Richard grinned, probably not. I'm like, what was the point there? I didn't quite get it. That, is it that Lyman's just a little bit older than Will Scott? I is think that what the thing is? That's okay. what I took it to be, that Will okay. Scott probably thinks Lyman is like years his elder. 
but really there's this tiny little gap between them. And like Will Scott needs to be in 22 or something like that. Yeah. Like, I don't know, how old is Lundman? I don't even know. That would be spoiler, D. Oh. Why do you think, yeah, why, I mean, why do you think Donut puts this here? Uh, well, you know, I, and that's what I think it is, is that Lyman's super young, yeah. and we're just not, I don't know, he's like, he's like 18, I don't know. Um, yeah, well, and I mean, I interpret Lyman being blank as like, he doesn't realize that Will thinks he's so much older. He, he this isn't even like occurring to him, and, and Richard sees like, you know, you're acting like you're so much older than him, but... I mean, the way the character is written, I assumed he was like in his mid thirties. I mean, yeah, at the start. That's, that's easy to assume. Yeah, that was my assumption. But this makes me think that he's significantly younger than we think he is. But yeah, it's just weird. But I do also love his reply. A year with Will Scott would make a day fly feel like Enoch said the master. <laughs> yeah. Whose side is he on now? Again. <laughs> right. But is he with me or is he with you? I'm still not sure. Like today, because he switches around so fast. <laughs> Several times a day. Yep. But he's back on uh, Lyman's side today, which is nice. Right, which Richard says dryly, because he's totally in on the joke of <laughs> Will Scott's fluctuating loyalties. Yeah. Um, and then there's also Lyman says he'll settle in time to a decent douche, douche for clue. Um, and it says, if Richard thought it unlikely after a year of Lyman's company, he said nothing. So he's probably thinking, uh, mm, who knows see. how Lyman corrupted him. Um, and then, then, I mean, it is interesting because I think Richard's thinking something negative about Lyman because then Lyman comes out with, nobody's going to hold you to a promise that needs this amount of nursing. So it's kind of back to like, you could just leave me to die. Um, and it says, uh, you know, he wasn't interested in a superficial reassurance. Uh, and, and Richard says, this is a wonderful, and another, another wonderful witty line, you think I'll discard in the perpendicular what I favor in the prone. Yeah. That was fun. Um, and then Richard does this, or sorry. <laughs> Lyman replies, not if you talk about it like that. <laughs> and then like critiquing his, yep. Richard no, makes obvious. this joke, and then Lyman's <laughs> like, yeah, that was a dumb joke. <laughs> oh. Uh, but no, he says you'll want an audience at any price. So he means like you're you're so witty that you're gonna want people to listen to you. I actually really like this progression where just a moment ago Lyman was trying to kill himself. I mean not in time wise, but in our, our time in reading the book. And now suddenly Richard and Lyman are laughing together. Mm -hmm. Like it it's so great this progression that happens as well. Which I think is an important part of why she's writing these things in. So Oh, and I think you need to see, like, you, you, brotherly love is what saved them, so you kind of need to then see mm -hmm. it. And it's also like your reward as a reader for all the suffering is to then have this beautiful bond. And, like, they're still a little bit tentative around each other at this point, but, like, it's definitely there, and it's definitely growing. And we need the resolution of, yeah. of this. Yeah. So then Richard, or sorry, then Lyman does this um, super annoying Lyman thing where he takes the horse and goes off and Richard freaks out and chases after him and is going to kill him if he catches him. Uh, but when he gets back, he finds that Lyman has just returned to the dell and is collapsed on the ground in front of the horse uh, with a sick placating grin face down. Um, so what the hell, Lyman? What is he doing? Well, I think Richard explains it. Like, I think Richard knows what he's doing when he says, you like to be sure of your relationships, who doesn't, but no one else does it by making themselves into a clearing nut for other people's emotions. Yep. <laughs> Which is exactly, it's like Lyman didn't know, he wasn't, he thought Richard would, you know, betray him or abandon him or something, so he's gonna test him by doing this thing, and Richard's just like, what is wrong with you? What's wrong with you? Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I also like that, um, Lyman may have been through, he may have been this heroic martyr and blah, 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 but he's also a mess. He's got some yeah. serious psychological issues. This is not a perfect, you know, hero. Um, I also love Richard's thing where he says next after that was, if my sentiments are in a muddle, like my emotions, if my emotions are in a muddle, said Richard angrily, I damn well prefer them to stay in a muddle without any interference from you. <laughs> in other words, just let me work it out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, I think there's another 
I mean, there's an indication, right? So L Richard brings Lyman some water. He lifts the cup, spills it badly, and sets it down again without drinking. Um, I think which tells us he's he's stressed, super stressed and upset about this too, even though he's pretending he's not. Um, it, he really was putting his brother and their relationship to the test. Um, but also, he then brings up Eloise and says, like, before we go back, we have to talk about what happened with Eloise. So I think he was also doing this to work himself up to talking about Eloise or maybe like a out from having to talk about Eloise because if Richard killed him, then they wouldn't have to have this terrible conversation. <laughs> but then Richard won't even have the conversation. Yep, he's like, nope, I've decided I'm going to save you. I don't want to hear it. Yeah. We can't have all the secrets revealed before the final chapter, D. Yeah. That wouldn't be any fun. True. There's got to be some mystery of what's going on. <laughs> um, so we, before we move on from the Dell um, and zoom through the rest of the chapters, because this was the interesting part um, of the rest of the chapter, let me show some fan art from uh, these scenes. Um, All right, can you see this mm -hmm. window? Okay, so this is, uh, I guess, the terrible suicide scene, Kisu. This is Prince of Pictou on Tumblr. Um, and then there's this heartbreaking uh, oh. God Francis had screamed. Uh, this is from Lenovo Draws. There we go. Gorgeous. Um, and then this is uh, Richard uh, when he convinces Lyman to um, that he's going to redeem him and save him. This is from Ying Draws on Twitter. Um, and then um, this is going back to the flashbacks of their childhood. Here's teenage Lyman with his books and his music, and I guess Richard and the dad outside, you know, doing sports. Um, I like the dragon eating a man in the background. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just a little detail. <laughs> oh, and this is by C. Barrington. Um, I'll, put the, I'll put all the links to all of these in the uh, YouTube comment uh, description. Um, this is Richard. I thought we should look at this Richard one um, from Hell's Own Apollo on Tumblr. Over here. Um, since this was such a important Richard chapter. Um, so Richard by Hells and Apollo. And then here is young Richard and younger Lyman um, and Sibylla pre Game of Kings by Bella Rowe on Deviant Art. And here is an imaginary childhood scene with I guess it's supposed to be Lyman, Eloise and Christian, and then Sibylla. Um, also by Bella Rolls. Although I would imagine Christian is closer to Lyman's age than Eloise's, but um, I don't know Lyman's age, so do not. Um, and then this is from Not a Pleasure on Tumblr, and this is from an AU that's set in like the 60s. Um, so here is, if it loads, the Stilla, Eloise, Richard, and Lyman watching the moon landing. I do love a good AU. What? I do love a good AU. I do love a good AU. Um, and then because we've been talking about Lyman's damage and his teen years, this is probably my favorite <laughs> fan art ever. Oh, he has an Eloise tattoo. <laughs> and, um, That's amazing. And the and the um the Margaret Lennox heart and then the F. That's so F brilliant. Yes, this is a work of genius and the bloody chessboard. Um, everything about this is perfect. That's fantastic. Francis Crawford of Hot Topic. Um, and this I'll is bring the bad decisions <laughs> that Patty's wearing. This is my <laughs> Stockholm Syndrome on Tumblr. And oh, we love it. It's one. Francis Crawford of Hot Topic. <laughs> uh, oh, and for everyone who doesn't read fanfic, AU means alternate universe. So, they work in a coffee shop or they're in a band. Yeah. 
Okay. Coffee shop AU. So we're done with Adele. Any final comments before we move on to the rest of it? Nope. All right. So then uh, we go to dinner in Lord's, Lord Grey's house and we're with the Somervilles. <laughs> She's like, I don't care. <laughs> Except that I like Kate. I like Kate. Yeah. Um, it goes herself to be pretty shrewd and on top of things in this chapter, which I like, but we already knew that about her, so. And I love, I did love this one moment where Kate is looking at the river and she says, she says she turned and looked across the river where the grass, identical, flower ridden and boisterous was the English grass. And it was just like, it was just this nice little moment of like the Scottish land and the English land are exactly the same and these stupid idiots are fighting in this ridiculous war. And, and she's just not having it and doesn't, she doesn't approve. <laughs> and we see why that she and Gideon helped Lyman because they care more about the common humanity than they care about the country. Yeah. Um, and they have a nice little moment. Kate wants to put the world's sorrows right in a night and it might take a night and a day. Um, we love them. Um, so. Then, oh, and also Gideon reads her stress as being about Philip was, um, is Philip going to be okay? He's, he's, again, he's so intuitive about what, what's actually going on with Kate. Um, okay, so then we go back to you. Scotland and England are at war, and a bunch of stuff happens. We don't really care, but what matters is that the Spanish go here, and the French go there, and then the Germans come in as the mercenaries, and blah, 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 blah. The important part is that Watts got a clue captures Sir Thomas Palmer. Yes. Do you remember Sir Thomas Palmer? Yes. You told us to remember him. Yeah, sure. He's he Samuel it. Harvey's cousin. Right. Okay. Ah, interesting. interesting. That's why. Indeed. So. Yeah, they have this very civil capturing where it's like, I'm Thomas Palmer. It's like, well, I'm. <laughs> What's that? It's like, and you know, we're gonna take you to jail now. Yep. Yeah, because it was, okay. it was worth more for them to take the captives than it was to kill the commanders on the field. So, right, and and everybody knew it's like, okay, somebody's gonna send some money or some other captives, and I'm gonna get exchanged. It was this whole, you know, like there's a whole system of, yeah, yep. quite civilized. Uh, anyway, so then um, Watt sees Richard and Lyman, and he goes over and talks to Richard. And I love their little exchange because as you, if you read through the lines, it's very clear that Watt knows Richard is helping Lyman escape and he's totally fine with it. It's definitely the best thing for Richard and his family. He kind of offers to pass along a message to Sibylla and he's kind of like, you know, um, he, he basically did the Scott family a service by whipping Will into shape, so. Yeah, yeah, and he's like, good luck in your future endeavors kind of, <laughs> kind of attitude. Yep. But then some other Scottish soldiers come riding up the hill. Yep, and Lyman sort of half-heartedly fakes an escape attempt to keep Richard safe, I guess, but really, you know, captures him. Poor Lyman. How to actually escape. He knows full well that he's like, he's resigned to his fate at this point. And I think it's telling that he knows that Richard wasn't trying to actually bring him in to yeah. captivity. That well, I think the only all... reason, the only reason he makes any movement at all is just to prevent Richard from protesting. Mm -hmm. Like he just he just doesn't want to meet the men with Richard by his side because Richard would object and he doesn't want Richard to object. So, yeah. yep, Richard, he knows his brother is a bad actor and that Richard now being on his side would protect him and that that would compromise Richard. And he's put in a lot of effort into not compromising Richard, so he's not gonna do it now. All right. So, but it is sad that after all that work, it came to this anyway. Because of one chance encounter. I think it was inevitable. It had to. Yeah, it's true. It's like the gun on the wall of the saloon. Like, but I think that the trial scene will be very interesting because yeah. there will be a trial. At least there better be. Yeah, and uh, yeah, the, nothing more sure than a, a sweet short trial and a swing in New Bigging Street. So, meaning it's inevitable that Lyman is going to hang. He's gonna hang. So, He's not going to hang. <laughs> It would be hard unless he was a zombie in the other. Yeah, yeah five books of zombie Lyman. That would be fun. There is a zombie five Lyman. Books of, five books of uh, prequel to this. No. There, there is a prequel series to this, too. Okay. The but House of Nicola. Yeah. Nicola. I still haven't read them. Oh. And you, 
you're saying that in front of all of the fans that are watching us, Laura? I tried, it's boring, it's Lyman's not in it. So, uh, we go then back to, uh, I guess we're at Meg Walter. Uh, we're with Sibylla, Agnes Harries, Marietta, and Johnny Bulo. Um, and alchemy. We get this wonderful extended alchemy sequence of Johnny Bulo is finally creating the Philosopher's Stone so they can turn lead into gold. Um, and we, we get basically a bunch of wonderful dramatic like Harry Potter kind of descriptions of this magic experience, um, which is of course all bullshit, but her descriptions are fun. Is, does your special uh, companion book tell us what the chemical is that he's using that makes the, because obviously this stone is a chemical that he's putting in it and it makes it go all blah, 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 you know, like smoke yes, and smoke. Yeah. dramatic and all that. Does it tell you what it is? Because I was curious. It is. Um, I don't think it does, but I mean, it could be a bunch of things. It, like, it's like, what, like 101 chemistry, like you put a certain yeah. stone in a fire, it turns colors and makes a bunch of smoke. It's like the volcano you make in you know it's like a very flaky substance whatever the stone actually is so so there's a ton of stuff in here about all the references he's making <laughs> like, um, all the, all these... like the magicians that he's referencing yep. i recognized a couple of them actually like the trismegistus yep and there's like different beliefs in alchemy like the imperfect metal the crude substance of saturn the alchemists believed each planet governed a mineral saturn ruled lead so there's a bunch of stuff like that uh, but I don't think it explains, because I don't think she gives you enough clues to know what the thing actually was. I don't think it matters. It's just all this, like, alchemy. Yeah. Mumbo jumbo. Mumbo jumbo, yeah. And the whole bit about the true it is without falsehood, certain most true, that which is above is like to that which is below, and that which is below is like that which is above. Like, that's just stuff that... Speaking of genre, this is such a scene. Like, I feel like I've seen this scene in, like, movies and, and, and read it before in books. Like, it's very... Um, out of the sort of in influence she's cobbled together is this scene. Um, and, and her descriptions are wonderful. Again, she can take a trope and make it so fun. And I, I love the stuff like with a waft and a roar, a blue smoke lipped like cream from the mouth of the retort, folded, arched, and rolled servilely through the hut. It just thickened, dropping languid fingers to the floor and flattening itself against the wooden roof. It became dense, black, and choking with the stink of sulfur. It yawned blindly in the senses and the fire, leaping as if freed of some monstrous birth, rent its thinnest layers with tongues of yellow and crimson. And then we get Agnes screamed. Full stop. Like, I love that contrast of like this sentence that just goes on and on and it's like the sentence is languid, you know, it's describing this languid thing and the sentence itself is really languid and all of a sudden Agnes screamed. <laughs> it's just this lovely, like it, it, it makes the writing feel like the scene, the writing physically on the page feels like the scene she's creating, you know? where this is whole, happening and then Agnes is like, wow! This whole scene totally fits into Agnes's sort of fantasy of the world. <laughs> I especially loved earlier in the scene um, when Sibylla, I think it was Sibylla, no, Marietta leaning over touched Agnes Harry's awake. And the final thing Agnes says is, what if he raises the devil? This completely like fantastical probability of what may happen. <laughs> It's the craziest perfect, thing happens. Perfect Agnes Harry's. Like, that's her character to a T, so. And I, I do love that Agnes and Marietta are both, like, super caught up in this, and Janet and Sapilla are, you know, they know it's bullshit. Of course. <laughs> I like Janet. Oh, I love Janet. So, uh, so then, of course, um, Sibylla is totally playing Johnny Bolo. She says, like, oh, let me see the stone. And when she gets it, she throws it into the fire, which keeps it, makes a distraction. So then she's able to basically uncover all the stuff he's been using because he's conning them. He's stolen their gold. Um, she gets it all. And then when the smoke clears, she reveals that she's known the whole time. Janet's been helping her. Um, you cannot get one over on Sevilla. Um, and now she is going to blackmail Johnny Bolo into doing what she wants because if he were revealed to have conned her, she could have him hanged. Mm -hmm. This is definitely Lyman's mother. Yep. Yeah. Um, Been on top of things the whole time, just like we suspected. Yep. And then we get the, what I think is the major clue that Philippe is right about Danny Hunter. 
And I even predicted that this would happen. I, I said totally. in a previous thing, like, if somebody else tries to kill Richard, yeah, it's and maybe, yeah. definitely not Lyman, then I'm sure of my theory. And right. here we have it. Yeah. So. And as soon as this happened, I was like, oh, here we go. <laughs> well, it even says right before it happened, he had said to Buclu and Dandy Hunter, <laughs> seeing him off, I'll be at Midculture before morning. Yeah. So who knows you're going to Midculture? Yeah, they're the only two people who know he's on the road. The person that's been trying to kill you for this whole book. Entire time. Steal your wife. <laughs> yep. Um, and so this like group of the Romani um, try to kill Richard, and then Johnny Bulo shows up and tells them no. Um, and he explains it to Richard as. Um, that he is at the mercy of the shrewdest of your relatives. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and Richard's like, my brother? And he's like, no, your mom. Not at all. Devil take it, not at all. <laughs> and I have to say <laughs> for myself, it's pretty easy to understand that it's Jolly, Johnny Bulo, even though it never actually says his name. But right. if this had happened at the beginning of the book, or maybe even, I don't know, eight or the middle of the book, I don't think I would have known. I don't think I would have been putting pieces together like that at that point, so. I mean, if they'd made it clear that the person who rescued Richard was Romani, I would have guessed it was Johnny Brillo, because that's the only person that, that was connected to the family. But, she but only after this, only after the fair scene, mm -hmm. only if it happened after the fair scene. And of course, this shows that Sibylla was shrewd enough to know that Dandy possibly would be making another attempt on Richard's life. So she sent Johnny to sort of the rescue. Unless she has absolute proof of it, maybe. That would be, well, we'll get there. Um, I also love Richard's mother. What now? What now? <laughs> mother. Uh, but um, no, I think in the early part of the book, you're just bombarded with so many characters. You try to keep track of them all, and they all have different names, even when they're the same person. That I could see, believe, like why you'd be confused at the beginning. But yeah. Now we know what's going on. What's happening? What's going on? Somebody tell me. So uh, now I can do it myself. No, I mean it's there's so many people that drop this book early on because they can't get through like the first hundred pages. Which is I almost did. I will admit, I was close to saying, "Guys, I'm out. I'm sorry." But <gasps> I stuck with it. And I'm glad I did. I'm so glad you stuck around. Um, what would we do without your theories, Philippe? All right, so then you touched You would have it. figured it out by now and it wasn't for me, I think. Uh, I don't know, man. I noticed the thing that you noticed about the brooch, like having, I was like, how come that dumb brooch is showing up? Like I literally had some question like that, but I did not actually ask the next question, which would be, <laughs> really why is the duck brooch showing up like i didn't go that i didn't take that step and you did well i only did it because laura suggested it so because i thought yeah. something was iffy so but uh, we still don't have proof of it uh, yeah I'm, but we so it's gotta be him i know unless there's a huge twist in the last yeah one. unless there's a major twist that hasn't been foreshadowed it's All been right. one out of book loop the whole time it's been Janet Beaton. She really wants to marry Otta. It's been Janet the whole time. Okay, so we cut back to uh, Richard arriving home after a long time and going up to Marietta's room and being nervous. Um, and he's kind of like afraid. And maybe I should have had one of her servants wake her up and see if she wanted to see me, but it's too late. I guess I'll knock. Um, and then I love that follow through on the previous scene that Marietta is dreaming about the alchemy experiment and says through a welter of necromantic smoke ridden dreams Marietta became aware of the light tap. When after a moment it was repeated she sat up fencing with the supernatural and you know she called out. Um, so I just I love that she's <laughs> still caught up in, dream, you know? and she's so caught up in it. Um, and then they have a really lovely conversation where, you know, it's a little tense at first and she kind of tests him and like asks him to choose between her and her and his brother, but then reveals that she wasn't actually asking that. Um, they actually talk. And they talk and they're yeah. honest and they actually really love each other and it's adorable. Yeah. Yay. And they, and it's quite wise, you know, he, he talks about the mistake is something you build on. 
Uh, it's the irritant that makes the pearl. So even though their marriage started out questionably, um, there's a lot of love there and they're gonna build on it and something good out of it. I love the end where he says, um, he doesn't want to be taken out of pity. And Mariotta is just like, out of pity? Like, my dear fool, why are you, you know, and she just, why am I fighting you and denying you and hurting you except that I'm so afraid of you and of myself because I love you far too well for peace and gentle harmonies. Yeah. Which is again, like, there takes me back to, um, uh, much to do about nothing and Benedict and Beatrice and it's like we're too peaceable <laughs> like and we're too like they can't love peaceably you know it's like I love that well and there's something so like she just has such insight into human psychology that this conflict between them is because they've loved each other too much and, and you know couldn't that caused all these emotions and fears that then went in this wrong direction like there's just a, a wonderful wonderful insight into how people are driven by these subconscious and underlying things that are not logical at all yeah. Um, her, her ability to write well-rounded characters just impresses me so much. So there's also a line here I wanted to ask you about. Do you think this is true? Richard says on 480, he says, Francis lives in a passionless vacuum and keeps his love for abstract things. Is that true? No. No, it's Richard's estimation of what's going on. We have already know he doesn't really know all of the facets of his brother, so. Right, I think, and Richard yeah, loves, sorry, keep going. No, it's just all right. I just think it's, it's part of what Lyman has portrayed to Richard again, so. Or it's yeah. just Richard's estimation of what's happening. Yeah, it, his love is not for abstract things. Like his love is for his brother and his mother and his country. And like, those aren't abstract, like those are people. And it, he, it, his love for his country isn't about an abstract concept of Scotland. It's about the people of Scotland and saving them and the land and the people who live on the land. And yeah, it's not abstract. Like, and he cares about, I mean, he cares about Gideon. He cares about, you know, <laughs> like it's not, it, it, it's, it's, it's all the people. I do wonder though, in the in the context Richard is referring, he's talking about, he says, perhaps you've married the wrong brother. So he's talking about romantic love. Mm. I 100% believe that Richard loves, sorry, Lyman loves Richard, Sibylla, Christian, maybe even, well, I don't know. He has a, a, a familial love. Does he have any passion love? Is his passionate love reserved for things like music and poetry? Does he not have, because we, because we, like Christian picked up something from him that is what made her say yes to Tom. So it makes me wonder if there is a. I mean, this is not a romance novel. Like we have, we haven't seen him romance anyone or fall in romantic love with anyone. But I don't think the absence of that proves the point. I think. It's not a romance novel. Like that's not the that's not the part of his story that we're seeing right now. So does that mean that that part of the story doesn't exist? Like I don't think that's true. Also, he's been through a ton of trauma. Like let the poor boy recover. <laughs> Maybe he'll find someone. But yeah, I would imagine that there was some passion with Margaret Lennox at some point. But we all yeah. know how that ended up. So right. Maybe he's afraid of that kind of thing, because it was a disaster the last time, so. And yeah. he was betrayed. Right, and that doesn't mean passionless, it just means caution. All possible. I find that an intriguing hint, but I don't know how much of it is the author and how much of it is just Richard. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think Richard, like, just because he doesn't see something doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. But I do think Lyman, well, We'll get there in the later book. We'll see. I, we need to see more of Lyman, basically. Yeah. Like, I think we just don't know at this point. There's, yeah, I'm there's definitely not going to say that he doesn't have that in his life, but we're also can't say he does. There's been a large portion of this book that is talking about Lyman and not from his point of view. In fact, we have seen very little of him at certain points. There were whole chapters where he was only mentioned and not even seen. So I'm interested to see if that stays true in the future novels. Yeah, and, and most of what we know is just conflicting opinions of him from other people and that we're 
we're sort of piecing together his personality and his convictions and passions, but only as seen from the outside. So. Speaking of the one person who knows him best in the world, Richard goes to visit Stella. Um, and she knows right away that he didn't kill his brother um, because he would not have kissed her if he had. Um, and he kind of tells her what happened. And she's, at first, she's, she's very happy that they've made their peace. But then when Richard says, basically, he doesn't think Lyman greatly cares about the results of the trial, that's when she gets a little worried. And she asks if it's because of Christian. So that tells me she's got, she knows her son so well, she knows he's really traumatized and upset about a lot. Um, and Richard says that not just Christian, but a number of things, which he's got some insight into his brother's trauma, finally. Yeah. Um, and then Sibylla tells us that she's not going to visit Lyman because it would only weaken him. Um, and she's going to go traveling. And someone is going to loathe her guts before she's finished with them. And my response to that was, we know who. What's going to happen? What's she going to do? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, any final comments on this chapter? And then what do you think is going to happen? So what do you want? Well, it was a good chapter. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't really have any more comments on the chapter because we've talked for quite a while about it. Uh, <laughs> this is probably the longest one. Next, well, we've got one chapter left. So everything that's unsaid. Um, I feel like Sibylla is definitely going to Balligan. And I don't think she's going to bring Richard or tell Richard because Richard would probably end up killing Andy. Um, and I don't know what she's going to do or how she's going to confront him, but maybe she'll go to Catherine if she's not in on it, because maybe she's on in it because they've made her out to be this horrible old woman. Uh, and then we're going to have the trial and find out what happens to Lyman. And I feel like hopefully a lot of the stuff that's been left unsaid or been in the sort of background is gonna come to light. Mm -hmm. um, we'll see. Yeah. I, I have a feeling, and I could be wrong, that we're not really gonna get, we'll get closure on what happened with Eloise, like the truth will come out about that. But mm -hmm. I don't know if we're gonna get any truth about what happened between him and Margaret Douglas. That may be for, oh, yeah. um, that may be left for future tellings. But I don't know. I that's agree. my feeling. I want two things. I'm only confident that two things are going to happen. I think we're going to learn the truth about Eloise and what happened there. And I think Dandy Hunter is going to get exposed. And other than that, I, I don't know if anything's going to happen. But I think a lot of the people that we've come to love in this book will definitely be on Lyman's side at this point. Yeah. If, they, if it's the kind of trial where they bring like character witnesses forth. I don't know how trials in 1547 Scotland work. So yeah, but we'll see. I don't either. <laughs> um, lack of history is embarrassing in this. <laughs> like I'm so embarrassed by how much I don't know. All uh, that I know because of Lara is that the judge has a name that I've already forgotten. The a, Dempster? Uh, I don't Dempster. Think it's a Dempster. That's right. Yeah. Um, who knows? Maybe the Lord is the one who's going to be the judge of Edinburgh or whatever. Um, but yeah, I just want to see Dandy Hunter get exposed. And I want to see people learn. I want to see Lyman learn the truth about what happened with his sister and everyone else learn the truth about what happened with his sister. And then, yeah. And I'd like to see... I'd like to see Sibylla be like fierce. I'd like to see her do something. Like when she does this whole like someone's gonna get mad at her, I'm like, oh yay. <laughs> like, I'm I'm looking forward to that. You think Lyman's gonna win in the trial? Or is it gonna be like he loses and he has to escape? I mean for my own satisfaction as the reader. I want there to be like a melodramatic win. Like I want him to be victorious. I want like Janet and Watts 
Scott and or and what and the clue and Will Scott and everybody to see the outcome like in every and you know the dowager queen to be there and like I want everyone to just acknowledge that Lyman has done this great service for Scotland and you know I don't know if that's gonna happen <laughs> like I feel like I feel like that's a lot to ask so and we've got a bunch of books coming up so I feel like if we're left on some sort of a like riding off into the night you know like that would be okay but yeah we'll see any final questions or comments wait the next chapter is the last chapter so ah. we will uh see you all then yay bye bye